Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning and good afternoon and actually good evening to everyone who's joining us online. There are hundreds of people joining us online and um, also many of you um, who are joining us online but also our distinguished guests. I want to particularly welcome, um, of course, Ambassador Green and Chairman Kim Sung Han and Chairman Kim Tae Ho and, di and distinguished guests, uh, Chairman Lee Jae-jung, National Assemblyman Choi young do and I will have a speaker, um, keynote speaker, um, Congressman, um, all welcome. Um, my name is Sumi Terry. I'm the director of the Korea Center and the Asia Program um, at the Wilson Center, Korea Center here. And on behalf of the Wilson Center and our event partner and co-host, the East Asia Foundation, I would like to welcome all of you to um, today's forum. It's called the U.S. Rock Alliance at 70, the outlook after the Washington Declaration. This is a milestone year in the U.S. ROC uh, relations, and here at the Korea Center, we've been having a series of forums this year. People who have been following us uh, know that we've been having a series of sessions to really celebrate the alliance. Today's forum, however, takes place in the aftermath of the successful Biden um, Yoon summit on April 26th, and the Washington Declaration, which really affirmed U.S. commitment to the ex extended deterrence. So what we have today is we have assembled a stellar group of um, experts uh, to analyze and explain where we have been and where we are going. But we, before we hear from them, um, I would like to first turn to Ambassador Green, um, Ambassador Mark Green, who is the president and CEO of the Wilson Center for his welcoming remarks. Uh, before coming to the Wilson Center, just to give a brief um, introduction, before coming to the Wilson Center, Ambassador Green served from 2017 to 2020 as the administrator of, uh, for the U.S. Agency of International Development. Uh, he has served as president of the International Republican Institute, executive director of the McCain Institute, president of the Initiative for Global Development, um, and um, senior director uh, for, at the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, and of course, U.S. ambassador to Tanzania, from mid-2007 to early 2009. Prior to that, he served um, four terms as US, at the U.S. House of Representatives, representing Wisconsin's 8th District. As you can tell, Ambassador Green has made a wide variety of contributions during his long public career in both foreign policy and domestic policy. So I would like to now welcome Ambassador Green to give some remarks to kick off this conference today. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for those uh, very generous, overly generous remarks. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Wilson Center. And good afternoon and evening to those who are watching us from on, uh, online from Washington to Seoul. As many of you know, the Wilson Center is a unique institution in the foreign policy landscape. We're congressionally chartered, we're scholarship driven, and we're fiercely nonpartisan and independent. Uh, as I always say, that special status also creates special obligations, uh, not to duplicate what others are doing, but to seek out the most important, to look for those areas that we want to elevate even higher where we can make a difference. That makes the Wilson Center the perfect place for today's discussion. And our partnership with Minister Kim Sung Hwan and his team at the East Asia Foundation. As uh, Sue just said, we are here to mark the significant milestone of 70 years of the Korean-American Alliance. But we're not only celebrating this history, we are looking to the future to assess the most important issues facing the alliance. A few months after President Biden welcomed the South Korean President Yoon to Washington for a state visit. Uh, as Sue said, and I completely agree, by any measure, it was a successful visit. It further solidified the close ties between the U.S. and the Republic of Korea. It even featured President Yoon's international singing debut. <laughs> I hope I do not have to sing today. First off, I could not compete. And secondly, you might all walk out, so we don't want to do that. We are proud to host this important forum with the East Asia Foundation, an independent, nonprofit Korean institution established to promote peace 
and prosperity in East Asia. They are truly a fitting partner for our work. Together with the East, A East Asian Foundation, we were able to bring together U.S. and Korean lawmakers to share their insights into the current and future of the U.S. ROC Alliance. You'll be hearing from them soon on the shared concerns facing the two allies, from how to create enduring peace and stability and security on the Korean Peninsula in the aftermath of the Washington Declaration, to what steps the U.S. and South Korea can take to work together on safeguarding supply chains and promoting innovative technologies. My hope is that this gathering of distinguished lawmakers and scholars can chart a path forward for the Alliance to make the next 70 years every bit as successful as the first 70 years. But before we hear from our panelists, allow me to introduce Minister Kim for his welcoming remarks. He currently serves as the East Asia Foundation's chairman. He previously served as South Korean Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade with a diplomatic career spanning nearly 40 years. He must have been seven or eight at the time that he started looking at him uh, today. As a former ambassador myself, I really am impressed with the width and the breadth and the depth of his ambassadorial appointments. Among his many roles, he served as the Korean permanent representative to international organizations in Vienna, ambassador to Austria, and later Uzbekistan. He is also a dear friend of the Wilson Center. We are lucky to have him and delighted to welcome he him here today. So once again, I turn to you, Minister Kim. We look forward to your remarks and we look forward to continuing our strong, productive partnership. Welcome. It's good to have you. Thank you, Ambassador Green, for your kind introduction. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And it is my honor and pleasure to present this special forum jointly organized by the Wilson Center and the East Asia Foundation, commemorating the 70th anniversary of the ROK-US Alliance. On behalf of the East Asia Foundation, I extend my sincere welcome to all of you. And I would like to take this opportunity to express my deep gratitude to President Mark Green and uh, Director of the Asia Program, Dr. Sumi Terry, for their tireless endeavor to bring this forum to fruition. I wish to express my special gratitude to Chairman Kim Tae-ho and Congressman Mark Takano, who kindly agreed to give keynote speeches today. I am equally grateful to other members of the Korean National Assembly and U.S. Congress in attendance here, Chairman Lee Jae-jung and National Assemblyman Choi hyung doo Congressman Ami Bera, who have taken this time, taken their time out of their busy schedule to join us. Today's discussions will greatly benefit from their first-hand policy exp experiences and insights. Uh, my gratitude also goes to the speakers of the second session, Ms. Tammy over here, uh, former president of U.S.-Korea Business Council, and Mr. Mark Kennedy. He's the director of WABA Institute of uh, Strategic Competition. And also Professor Park Tae-ho, former trade minister of Korea, and Mr. Kim Young-jae, economic minister at the Korean Embassy in Washington, D.C. Last but not least, we are in excellent hands with our two moderators, Mr. David Sanger, White House and National Security Correspondent for the New York Times, and Ambassador Mark Lippert, former U.S. Ambassador to Korea. Uh, they will expertly guide us through the first and second session, respectively. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the ROK-U.S. Alliance. And it is gratifying to note that for the last seven decades, it has overcome many challenges together and evolved into a mutually beneficial partnership based on common security imperatives, economic interests, and values. Initially, our alliance served security functions primarily. However, the value of ROK-US alliance is not limited to the joint pursuit of security. It has also contributed to fostering 
a closely intertwined and prosperous economic partnership between the two countries. In the years after the Korean War, you would not have considered South Korea an equal partner of the United States by any measure. However, Korea grew stronger economically, our alliance and the relationship grew stronger too. The bilateral free trade agreement, which came into effect in 2012, is one of many milestones that show how strong our partnership has grown. South Korea is now America's sixth largest trading partner, dealing in everything from cars to high-tech equipment. It is arguably the greatest success story of U.S. engagement with Asia. The economists even called Korea a model American ally. Since President Yoon suk yeols inauguration in May of last year, his government put a great deal of effort into expanding the scope and depth of cooperation with the United States. In particular, it made it a top priority to bolster the security alliance, and these endeavors seem to be surely paying off. During President Joe Biden's visit to Korea last year, the two leaders agreed to upgrade the ROK-US alliance to a global comprehensive strategic alliance. This means not only do we jointly tackle issues that immediately concern the Korean Peninsula, such as extended nuclear deterrence, but we are ready to expand our cooperation to other areas with broader global implications, such as nuclear non-proliferation and space exploration. As you are all aware, the most pressing security challenge for South Korea is the North Korean nuclear threat. A growing number of South Koreans believe that South Korea needs its own nuclear weapons or that at least U.S. tactical nuclear weapons should be deployed to Korea to respond, respond more effectively to the evolving North Korean threat. The Washington Declaration announced back in April during President Yoon's state visit to the United States represent another step forward in the ROK-US alliance. President Yoon and B President Biden pledged to establish a nuclear consultation group and regularly deploy a U.S. nuclear submarine to Korea. It is my hope that the declaration will serve as an effective tool for countering North Korean provocations, as well as for assuring the South Korean public of the U.S. commitment to extending a nuclear umbrella. South Korea and the United States share important historical ex experiences and interests. And they are certainly very powerful factors that have contributed to strengthening our alliance. But there is another factor just as important. We share similar values. Both nations cherish individual liberties, human rights, democracy, and market economy. And we have worked together to provide various forms of protection for these values. I strongly believe that an alliance built on shared values will far outlast one based solely on cold calculation of national interests. Before I conclude uh, my remarks, let me say a few words about our East Asia Foundation. East Asia Foundation was founded in 2005 with generous funding from Hyundai Motor Company to build a network of regional experts in and outside Korea. We have extensive exchange programs with a number of universities and research institutions in the United States, Japan, and China. And we also publish a quarterly English language journal entitled Global Asia. Once again, I'm grateful for your participation, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on where this special relationship and partnership should be headed in the coming decades. Thank you. So I'm going to now ask Chairman Kim Tae-ho uh, for his welcoming remarks. Um, just quick introduction, Chairman Tae-ho Kim um, is a member of the 21st National Assembly of the Republic of Korea, affiliated to People's Power, People Power Party. 
He's currently the chairman of the Committee on Foreign Affairs and Unification. He also served as member of the 18th and 19th National Assembly of the Republic of Korea, elected in Kimhae, 2nd District, as well as the 32nd and 33rd um, governor of South Gyeongsang Province. So mm. I would like to welcome Chairman Kim. Uh, 저는 어, 대한민국 국회 외교 통일 위원회 지금 위원장을 어, 맡고 있습니다. 오늘 이 소중한 자리에서 어, 이렇게 에, 귀한 분들 같이 에, 함께 했다는 게 굉장히 저 개인적으로 영광의 자리라고 생각합니다. 이렇게 소중한 자리를 또 마련해 주신 윌슨 센터의 에, 음, 마크 그린 우리 회장님 어, 정말 감사합니다. 그리고 우리 김성환 그 장관님 지금 동아시아 아, 재단 어, 이사장님으로 계시죠. 정말 어, 감사드리고요. 또이 자리에 같이 해주신 그 아미 이, 베라 의원님 그리고 또 많은 또 의원님들 특히 또 저와 같이 어, 한국에서 와주신 이재정 우리 위원장님, 최영대 의원님, 그리고 우리 어, 박태호 교수님을 비롯한 많은 분들 어, 함께해서 정말 어, 감사드립니다. 어, 워싱턴 DC에는 제가 어, 2주 전에, 아, 참두달 전에 어, 윤석열 대통령의 국빈 방문 때 같이 어, 이 자리에 왔었습니다. 어, 그때 제가 어, 포기 바텀, 포기 바텀, 두이노 포기 바텀, 바텀 지역을 이렇게 거닐면서 우리 한미 관계의 현주소, 우리의 모습은 어땠을까 이런 생각을 하면서 어, 그 동안에 그야말로 그 안개가 자욱한 이 저지대에 우리 한미 관계가 놓여 있었다면 이제는 윤석열 정부의 출범 이후에 이제 제대로 이그 안개 낀 저지대를 벗어나서 뭔가 정상적인 궤도로 가는 어첫 스텝을 또 밟지 않았나 이런 생각도 어 해봤습니다. 여러분 그렇게 생각하지 않습니까? 네. <웃음> 어 그렇지만 지금 여전히 또 미중 간의 어떤 그 갈등 그리고 러시아 우크라이나의 어떤 전쟁 상황 또 저희들이 지금 많이 그 우려하고 있는 유무형의 혹시 이 중국이 이 대만을 침공하지 않을까라는 유무형의 그런 그 애척과 우려들이 지금 많이 상존하고 있습니다. 이런 그 복잡한 어 국제 상황 속에서 오늘 이런 윌슨 센터와 우리 한국의 동아시아 이 재단 간의 연구 재단 간의 많은 그, 그 좋은 지혜 이런 해법들을 찾아갈 수 있는 좋은 지혜가 어 나오기를 그 단초가 만들어지기를 저희들은 강하게 또 희망하고 있습니다. 어 제가 그두달 전에 국빈으로 윤석열 대통령을 모시고 어 같이 이렇게 모든 일정을 소화했는데 어 그때 양 정부 간에 선언한 워싱턴 선언 어 정말 대단한 저는 그 의미를 어 부여하고 어 있습니다. 사실 우리 대한민국은 북의 핵기업으로부터 항상 노출되어 있습니다. 다르게 표현하자면 이 활화산 언제 터질지도 모르는 화산 밑에서 지금 살고 있는 그런 형국입니다. 이번 워싱턴 선언은 그야말로 북의 핵의 억지력 북이 핵으로 장난치지 못하게 오판하지 못하게 하는 강력한 저는 제재의 시그널을 준 그런 선언이었다. 저는 그렇게 생각하고 있습니다. 우리 대한민국 국민들도 많은 기대와 또 믿음을 어, 가지고 있습니다. 그래서 한미 상호 방위 조약이 70년 전에 바로 이곳 워싱턴에서 어, 이루어졌듯이 거기에 플러스 또 진화된 우리 한미 관계의 질적 변화의 선언도 또 바로 이곳에서 이루어졌고 오늘 또 그런 워싱턴에서 다시 또 이런 
어, 행사가 이루어진다는 건 굉장히 의미 있다고 봅니다. 그동안 70년 동안에 어, 우리 한미동맹의 태생과 또 성공을 위해서 그동안 헌신하고 또 어, 희생해 오신 분들에게 이 자리를 빌어서 한없는 존경의 마음과 감사의 마음도 어, 전하고 싶습니다. 저는 가장 중요한 게 결국에 그 나라가 어떤 가치로 어, 미래로 가느냐. 바로 우리 보편적 가치인 자유와 민주와 또 법치와 인권과 이런 보편적 가치 위에서 같이 동맹을 하고 또 그런 뜻을 같이 하고 있는 국가들 간의 그 연대를 통해서 그 탄탄한 배경 위에서 결국 미래로 가야 그게 지속 가능하고 저는 번영의 바탕이 된다고 봅니다. 지금 새로운 국제 질서의 재편 속에서 저희들도 많은 갈등과 또 많은 희생도 있는 건 사실입니다. 그렇지만 은 잠시의 희생보다도 우리가 지속 가능한 그 미래의 어떤 번영을 위해서 또그 가치를 위해서는 더 강력한 연대와 동맹이 필요하다는 생각을 갖고 있습니다. 이 강력한 힘을 바탕으로 한 평화 또 자유만이 그게 진정한 자유고 평화라고 저는 생각합니다. 어, 오늘 어, 이 자리를 통해서 진짜 의미 있는 어, 그 좋은 고견들이 나오기를 바라고요. 특히 저희 대한민국 국회에서는 오늘 이 자리에 여야 같이 의원들이 같이 왔습니다. 바로 이 말은 외교 안보에 있어서는 여야가 따로 없다. 그리고 우리 대한민국 국회에서 한미동맹 70주년을 어, 통해서 다시 한번 잘해보자. 양국의 발전을 위해서 어, 힘을 모, 한번 모아보자는 그런 촉구 결의안을 만장일치로 또 우리 대한민국에서 여야가 합의해서 통과시켰습니다. 그리고 현재 또 한미의원연맹을 어떻게 결성할까 그런 창설을 위한 준비 모임도 이루어지고 있다는 말씀을 드리면서 우리가 여야 또 우리 온 국민들이 특히 한미동맹이 우리 미래로 가는 가장 소중한 바탕의 환경이다. 그런 믿음 위에서 우리가 같이 나무를 심어간다면 바로 그 나무는 큰 거목으로 커갈 수 있다는 믿음을 갖고 있습니다. 오늘 이 자리에서 더 강력하게 서로 엮어주는 네트워크로서의 바로 이 자리에 여러분들이 힘이 되어주시기를 바라고요. 우리는 함께 미래로 갑니다. We are the world, we are the family. Thank you very much. <웃음>
dedicated to the memory of Dosan on Chang Ho. And the city is looking to build, actually, um, in cooperation with uh, some benefactors, uh, maybe a conference center or, or some, some sort of a, a, of a building. So uh, I'm very you know, proud to have that part of a Korean history associated with the congressional district that I represent. Pachapa Hill was one of the uh, early, early Korean uh, settlements of Korean immigrants. Uh, and uh, so I'm also very proud uh, to have that in my district. Um, so I want to sincerely thank the Wilson Center for this opportunity to speak on the strategic importance of the U.S.-Rock relationship as we celebrate and mark the 70th anniversary of the alliance uh, and posit what the future may hold for this enduring relationship. I've had the chance to travel uh, a few times to South Korea uh, and uh, several times with the Mansfield uh, Foundation as part of uh, a legislative exchange that involves uh, Japanese diet members and Korean South Korean assembly members. And so I've, I've had a chance to uh, reconnect with many of those South Korean assembly members uh, this morning. Good to see you. Welcome back. To, welcome to the United States. Um, uh, I also organized a congressional delegation. Um, I believe this was the November of 2021. Uh, I led the, a congressional delegation as chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee to the Indo-Pacific uh, and uh, Japan, Korea, uh, and Taiwan uh, were, were all part of that, uh, 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 that uh, congressional delegation. I've seen, I'm joined by my uh, colleague Ami Berra, who is the uh, ranking member of the subcommittee on um, East Asia for the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, welcome, Ami. Um, uh, and then uh, I also was uh, part of the delegation, a member of the delegation that Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi led uh, to uh, a few more partners in addition to South Korea, uh, Japan, and Taiwan. We also went to Malaysia and Singapore. Now over time, I've witnessed uh, clearly shifting dynamics in regional security, global economics, domestic politics in both nations. Uh, both the United States and uh, South Korea. And it leads me to the point today that while opportunities and challenges face the U.S. ROC relationship, um, that there are vast uh, challenges, fa uh, vast challenges and also vast opportunities, the U.S. ROC alliance has been, has been, and shall remain strong. Um, I note that um, uh, exchange programs are very strong between uh, the United States and South Korea. Uh, I would say far stronger than I've seen um, in Japan, actually. Uh, I notice far more fluency uh, in uh, English fluency within Korea. Uh, and uh, the success of um, K-pop, uh, K-drama, uh, is only to be sort of rivaled. Uh, I took, uh, I had along with me on uh, the last legislative exchange, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who uh, taught me about uh, K Cosmetics, uh, and I, I, I put some on this morning, some moisturizer, uh, and you know, it's, uh, it's the draw of, uh, you know, a Japanese woman come to uh, Seoul uh, to buy these products. I had no idea. Uh, but they're excellent products, especially the sunscreen. It really works well. Um, so, uh, uh, North Korea, uh, you know, obviously presents a significant concern for both countries and remains a central pillar of the bilateral security alliance. The nuclear threat posed by North Korea threatens not only South Korea's security, but also represents a flashpoint for a global conflict that could draw the United States and its allies in. Um, and I happened to be around, uh, I was actually in Tokyo in Seoul during the time that President Trump, uh, the former president, uh, was referring to uh, Kim Jong-un as Little Rocket Man. Uh, this was all sort of uh, on its, you know, uh, reaching a sort of high point and it was very scary. Um, uh, legislators were listening with uh, very, very uh, attuned ears to what American legislators 
had to say uh, during this moment. And uh, I was also around when he reversed course and became the first U.S. sitting president to step foot uh, in North Korea during the 2019 summit. A summit of, and it reminded me of the sort of uh, situation that uh, we were in in the 70s uh, when President Nixon, uh, uh, aided by Henry Kissinger, had this madman theory of some sort of unpredictable response by, uh, by an American president would be a credible deterrent, like you, never, you didn't know what he was going to do. And it was an uncertain time for the U.S. ROK alliance um, as the former president left U.S. leaders and South Korean political figures perplexed uh, while trying to understand what were his true foreign policy, what was his true foreign policy posture. Um, and I'm speaking frankly about my views. Um, I think the government then, uh, the liberal government, which I have many affinities with, uh, was maybe a little too enthusiastic um, to have an American president give hope to the notion that North and South Korea could be united, fulfilling an age-old aspiration of a united Korean peninsula. I personally hold out hope that that's going to happen someday. Um, but yet today, uh, we have the foresight and the hindsight to know that North Korea's aggressive posturing, frequent missile, missile tests, many directed at our allies, and its unwavering pursuit of nuclear weapons capabilities pose some of the gravest threats to the region and the world. And sadly, uh, despite uh, you know, th that face-to-face -face, uh, meeting a couple of times, uh, there remains no end in sight. China's rising influence in the Indo-Pacific has also significant security and economic implications for the U.S. ROC alliance. And South Korea's proximity to China is such that South Korea is subject to immense political and economic pressure. Uh, and while the United States views China as a strategic competitor, the ROK, the ROC, has no choice but to hold a more nuanced view with China being, being South Korea's largest trading partner. And even Japan, which we regard as one of the closest allies to the United States in the region, is also significantly invested and somewhat reliant on China economically. This economic interdependency places tremendous pressure on the U.S. ROC relationship as the country's primary security partner. Now, how is this going to evolve as Sino-American competition increases? And what steps, and by the way, I, I welcome and fully am heartened by these recent efforts uh, between uh, with President Biden and, and, and President Xi to try and stabilize, uh, to reach some sort of stability. Uh, that's very important for, I think, the entire region. Um, what steps will the US, Korea, and Ch or China take to defuse tensions in the Indo-Pacific? And I'm happy that we, we're seeing some uh, efforts to stabilize the relationship between the US and China. That has implications, obviously, for Korea and Japan. Now, these are all questions that I'm sure you're going to hear more about uh, during the conference. Um, further, uh, several trade and economic issues between the US and Korea linger over disputes around electric vehicles or steel imports, remnants of the Inflation Reduction Act and the Trump era tariffs. And despite South Korea being the United States' sixth largest trading partner, Trade relations are challenged on several of these fronts as the U.S. leans into its strategic competition with China, while South Korea seeks stability and predictability in its trade relations. And as I have met with uh, South Korean assembly members, the issue of trade uh, always arises. Uh, and um, I, t I speak very frankly that politically and domestically in the United States of America, uh, neither party is uh, especially eager uh, to deal with the trade issue, uh, and that I don't think is a good thing for the United States. The United States does need to reemerge um, as a leader uh, on trade issues, um, but we have our own domestic uh, house to get in order. Uh, I would suggest, and I've suggested in many forums, that one, one, I think, uh, important pathway to consider is to think about uh, how trade can be built around uh, reducing uh, carbon, uh, uh, meeting uh, 
carbon reduction targets? How can trade be calibrated to do that? And that, uh, uh, that is a, a political pathway to domestic support in the United States for more robust trade engagement. Uh, we are no strangers to South Korea's own internal politics, uh, which pose some risks for the alliance. And while the United States is applauding President Yoon's overtures about a cooperative partnership between South Korea and Japan, um, I believe my own country must be cautious not to see only what it wants to see and recognize that President Yoon uh, won a very uh, close election with the opposition party holding a majority in the National Assembly. And so the Western press, the American press, I think uh, has captured what has uh, occurred most recently uh, with very sort of um, uh, 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 rose-colored glasses in a way. And I think we need to understand, again, Korea's, South Korea's position um, very close to China and uh, how economically engaged they are and understand the situation is far more nuanced. Uh, and uh, the current uh, sort of American mindset of uh, fully trying to uh, uh, deal with the rivalry with China, uh, that, we, that we look more closely and understand uh, the, the far more complicated situation that our allies face. And I don't know that many of my colleagues in Congress fully appreciate um, uh, this, this situation of South Korea. And finally, a strong ROK-Japanese relationship uh, is critical to our success in the region. And we've noted the, uh, the, growing, um, uh, and the, the growing, I think, uh, familiarity with the uh, with the Prime Minister, um, uh, uh, blanking on his name, the Prime Minister of Japan, Kishida, Kishida Prime Minister Kishida, and President Yoon. Um, but also, again, they're also underlying uh, this effort, uh, a lot of history. Uh, and as a Japanese American, I've come to believe that these two alliances, these two allies, are important in promoting our shared democratic values, uh, and they're vital. Uh, to the stability and inter interoperability of the alliance. I personally believe it would be um, a good thing for the militaries of these three nations to become more interoperable. They already share intelligence. They already do, to some degree, have some interoperability. But the alliance, the military alliance, is basically bilateral, bilateral. Bilateral with Japan, bilateral with South Korea. Um, but uh, the historical and cultural and uh, uh, unresolved issues of um, reconciliation uh, from uh, the World War II era, um, these are still challenges. Uh, and, uh, but I believe that everybody needs to rise up above uh, those histories. Uh, and, uh, and there needs to be effort on all sides to make that happen. Uh, and what America has to offer is to remind these two countries uh, is uh, of the importance of the alliance and to need the need to rise above history. And everybody's going to have to do their part. Um, yet above all, despite these challenges and ever-changing global dynamics, the U.S. ROC alliance remains vital and the U.S. ROC alliance remains strong. And I believe that alliances and our shared democratic values will be one of the most important determinants of the balance of power in the Pacific. And the U.S. ROC alliance is a pillar of an ensuring, uh, an ensuring a free and open Indo-Pacific. And one of the ways in which I see strengthened relations between our two countries is through improved domestic diplomacy, increasing touch points between our governments and our people. Uh, for example, as the former chairman of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs and now ranking member, I led the introduction uh, this year and the passage through the House of Representatives of the Korean Valor American Act which would grant veterans who served in the armed forces of the Republic of Korea during the Vietnam War 300,000, 300,000. That's an important thing to remind Americans of uh, is this amazing contribution by the ROC of 300,000 troops that fought alongside uh, Americans uh, during the Vietnam War. Um, several thousand of those 
combatants naturalized as U.S. citizens uh, and consider themselves veterans of that war, even though they didn't fight for the United States. Uh, and they, uh, uh, when I passed uh, legislation called the Vietnam Veterans uh, Blue Water Navy Act, uh, which gave um, benefits uh, to veterans who served on uh, U.S. naval ships, I had many of these ROK uh, service members show up at these events and saying, look, many of us live in the United States. We are now citizens of the United States. We, we suffer from PTSD. We suffer from uh, exposure to Agent Orange. Uh, we, are, we don't have the income to fly back to Korea to, uh, to get our, our medical treatment. We have mental health issues. We want access to uh, the amazing uh, care that we can get at VA medical centers. And we found out that there's a precedent for allies of the United States to get treatment, uh, veterans of, these, uh, of the alliance. And uh, you know, there have been reciprocal agreements between uh, uh, World War I and World War II allies, like France and, and Britain and Canada, uh, we have these reciprocal agreements to take care of each other's veterans. Uh, we have not done that for an Asian ally. Uh, in fact, we have on a non-reciprocal basis taken care of veterans from the Czech, from, from the Czech Republic uh, and uh, Poland. Um, Korea is a wealthy, rich nation today. Reciprocity would be a recognition of Korea's um, you know, economic uh, stature, but also as their stature of a U.S. ally. Not only would this bill deliver long overdue health care to those who have served, it acknowledges the critical role Koreans have played as stewards of democracy at home and abroad through their military service, these types of initiatives are needed to foster relationships um, at the highest levels, show our highest levels of respect. Uh, of respect. Um, and I'm hopeful that the Senate's going to pass this legislation and that um, we will see the Secretary of the VA and the Minister of Veterans and Patriots in Korea work out an agreement. So I, as a progressive Democrat, would very much love to see South Korea and its military become more interoperable with the U.S. and Japan so that our concern over North Korea is balanced with the U.S. desire for freedom, I think everyone's desire to see freedom of navigation through the Taiwan Strait. And as we mark the 70th anniversary and celebrate the Washington de Declaration, I'm invigorated by this gathering, knowing the officials and experts in this room are thinking critically about the next steps for bolstering this alliance and the future of both nations. President Biden was right to characterize the alliance as one that has grown into uh, a global alliance that champions democratic principles and enriches economic cooperation. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you this morning, and best wishes for a fruitful and engaging conference. Thank you. Okay, can we, we're running a little late, so can we have the first panel come up? David. You're here. Well, good morning. I'm uh, David Sanger. I'm a, a fellow here, visiting fellow here at the um, Wilson Center working on uh, a book, but I'm delighted to uh, uh, also have a chance to go um, have this talk about uh, Korea and the follow-on to the Washington uh, Agreement. Uh, we have a great panel for you today, and I look forward to delving into all of this. And uh, I know, Congressman, you have to leave a little bit early, so we're going to uh, we're going to um, grill you a little more at the beginning. <laughs> Sounds end. good. Uh, so uh, so that you'll be able uh, to to get out uh, here in time. Um, so um, I'm delighted to be uh, joined by Sumi Terry, uh, also uh, uh, 
runs the uh, the career program here uh, at Wilson. Um, Representative Ami Berry, who you can uh, read about in uh, uh, your um, uh, in in your uh, documents here, but of course uh, represents. Uh, Cal we seem to be long on the California <laughs> delegation here today, uh, which is good, but uh, also is. Uh, uh, on the Korea Caucus, as I recall, right? Um, and then we have uh, two friends from uh, the National uh, Assembly, uh, Jae Jung Lee and um, Kang Du Che, and I thank you both for uh, joining us today, and we look forward to hearing from you um, as well. I think I want to start with um, the visit that we uh, just saw uh, concluded with um, President Yoon and uh, uh, President Biden. I was just in South Korea just before the visit happened. And there were a few things I wanted to sort of go dig in with you. And I, I think I'll start with you, um, Congressman. Um, the high point of this, of course, was the Washington Agreement, which I think is reasonable to say was an effort to try to um, draw South Korea not only more fully into the um, alliance, but to try to stem the conversations that are underway in South Korea now uh, about getting an independent nuclear force. It's driven some by North Korea's um, success, which we'll talk about it in a bit, and building up a, a very significant arsenal, but also rooted in a deep doubt about uh, the United States, one that I think was fueled uh, early on, it's always been there, but fueled early on in the Trump administration when during the campaign, President Trump said to me in the first foreign policy interview we had done that he didn't see any reason for American troops to be in South Korea, and of course talked about why you would want to go spend money protecting a country with which you had a trade deficit. Wasn't quite sure I ever quite got what the connection was, but. But that was, that was the connection he made. Um, so I guess my first question to you is, is this going to do the trick? Will, is it the view of uh, the members of the Korea Caucus and others that this was about as far as the US could go uh, in this regard? Um, and is there any nervousness or not about bringing South Korea more directly into the nuclear decision making? You know, I, I, so let, let's start with, you know, President Trump, you know, his foreign policy perspective was slightly different than where members of Congress were, because I think during the Trump administration, you saw members of Congress in a bipartisan way, Democrats and Republicans push back on that, because, you know, the, the relationship and the alliance with um, Korea is not a transactional one. It's a deep one that is rooted in both the, the geopolitical strategic um, and security interests, not just of the Korean Peninsula, but also of the United States. And, you know, I, I, so, you know, to those in um, Korea that are watching, I think in, in a very steadfast way, Democrats and Republicans recognize the importance of this alliance. And I think you've seen that with the Biden administration very early on um, doing strategic um, two by twos and, and high level meetings. And you know, I think that culminated with, um, you know, what was at, at that time, we'll have the third state visit um, this evening, but you know, the second state visit, and, and I think that was very intentional to signal to the Koreans that they are a very important strategic ally and partner. It's also recognition, you know, that President Yoon, to some risk to his own domestic politics, has taken, um, you know, the approach of, you know, re-solidifying the USROK alliance, you know, getting the trilateral alliance, um, the ROK, Japan, United States, to a much better place and, and moving that forward. And then also talking about the strategic um, and security importance. So do I think the Washington Declaration allies um, all concerns? No. But do I think it's a step in the right direction? Certainly. And One, one follow-up on that. So one of the initial concepts of it had been bring Japan in as well. Um, that didn't get announced at that time. It's something I think everybody's still trying to figure out if they can make work. Um, has its challenges, both domestically in Japan, because uh, explaining inside Japan that Japanese officials are having discussions about scenarios in which you would use nuclear weapons gets pretty close to the three no's. 
Um, but the, um, the second problem would be whether they could work with the South Koreans on a common strategy. Um, based on what you've heard from the administration, Congressman Barr, have you gotten a sense that this is going to go ahead, that it's workable? And do you think it would actually be a more powerful agreement if Japan and South Korea were both members of it? You know, I think, um, you know, that, that I don't have the, the insight if you'll, you'll get that trilateral um, arrangement. But you know, I think the, the Japanese are secure in understanding the, the U.S. nuclear deterrence. And, and I think um, the Washington Declaration you know, it is a gesture to the, the Koreans that you know, the nuclear deterrence is still there. Um, I think both countries and both governments, um, President Yoon's administration as well as Prime Minister Kishida's administration, understand the risk of setting a nuclear arms race um, off in, in East Asia. I think we all share a healthy concern, obviously, of what North Korea is doing, but also um, the nuclear proliferation that we're seeing in the PRC right now. And you know, how can we stem that and, and turn that around? Um, I want to ask basically the same question of how the Washington Agreement is perceived of both of our visitors from um, the South Korean uh, Assembly. <coughs> Give us a sense of, of uh, whether you think this did the trick, uh, whether or not you believe that it actually could turn around South Korean public opinion or not on the question of an independent nuclear force. We start with you. Mm -hmm. 어, 저는 어, 의외의 다수당이긴 하지만 어, 야당이거든요. 그래서 여당에서 먼저 평가를 하시고 제가 좀 대표를 하면 어떨까 생각합니다. 네, 실질적으로 북한의 핵 위협은 매우 실질적이고 지금 어, 최근에 북한의 미사일 발사 인공위성이라고 이야기했습니다만 어, 서울의 전체적으로 경보가 울리는 굉장히 심각한 상황이 있었습니다. 굉장히 위협, 위협이 고조되고 있고 이 문제에 대해서 이제 저희들은 과거 드골이 했던 고민을 프랑스의 드골 대통령이 했던 고민을 많이 상, 상기를 시킵니다. 과연 미국이 북한 핵미사일의 위협을 워싱턴과 로스앤젤레스 받을 때그 위협을 무릅써가면서 대한민국 서울과 부산을 지켜줄 것이냐 어, 과거 프랑스가 측에 얘기했던 질문인데 우리 한국 내에서도 많은 분들이 북한의 핵미사일 위협이 ICBM 능력이 실질적으로 고도화되어서 어, 만일 전 세계를 위협하게 된다면 한국은 스스로를 지켜야 될 힘이 있, 있어야 되지 않은가라는 그 생각들을 많이 하고 있습니다. 아마도 이것은 어, 전체 NPT 레지, 저 체제라든가 또 회각산을 억제하려는 미국의 입장 또 서방 국가들 입장에서 아마 미국들이 힘들겠지만 그렇다면은 실질적으로 나토 수준의 핵 억지를 또 실제로 반격 능력을 우리 대한민국이 미국과 함께 공유할 수 있느냐 이런 문제에서 어 그렇게 아주 100% 만족스럽다고 생각할 수는 없겠지만 그러나 한미 간의 서로 도출해낸 최선의 결론이라고 생각하고 있습니다. 어 최근에 제가 이제 국내에서 주로 강조하는 바는 한국과 미국과 일본이 특히 협력을 기울여야 될 부분은 한국이 독자적으로 또 일본이 독자적으로 핵미사일을 개발할 수 없다면 은 그래서 핵균형을 유지할 수가 없다면 은 우리는 한국과 미국과 일본이 북한의 핵미사일 발사 시도를 굉장히 일찍 포착해서 그 초기에 그걸 저지할 수 있는 그런 능력을 공동으로 개발한 것도 굉장히 중요하다 이렇게 생각합니다. 어, 예, 근데 북한이 핵미사일 발사를 준비했을 때 지금은 고체 연료를 사용하고 있고 또 잠수함에서 또는 때로는 저수지에서 발사하고 있기 때문에 그 초기에 그 발견하기가 디텍트하기 굉장히 어렵습니다. 그러나 그럴수록 한반도 한국의 그 능력 또 미국의 위성 어, 감지 능력 또 일본의 이런 그 감지 능력을 합침으로써 실제로 북한의 핵미사일 도발을 하는 초기에 그걸 저지하거나 인터셉트할 수 있는 능력을 어느 정도 갖추고 있느냐 이런 것들에 좀더 저는 많은 관심이 있는데 그런 분야에서도 어, 앞으로 한국과 미국의 협력이 좀더 강화되어야 될것 같고 
어쨌든 이 워싱턴 컨센서스가 한국 사람들 그리고 일본 사람들 동북아의 사람들한테 충분한 어시오런스가 되지 않는다면 은 북한이라든가 또는 인접 국가들의 그런 어 어떤 도, 어 도발의 가능성 그런 것들에 대해서도 우리가 충분히 안심하기 어려울 거다 생각을 합니다. 그러나 이건 뭐 지금 국제적으로 핵무기를 더 이상 동북아 아예 더 이상 개발할 수 하게 없다는 이런 핵 확산 어떤 어 기조에 따라서 좀 불가피한 현실을 생각을 하고 그렇다면은 실제로 워싱턴 합의에서 약속했던 그런 것들이 국민들이 우리 대한민국 국민들이나 또는 동아시아에 따른 어 국민 어 시민들이 충분히 안심할 수 있을 정도의 그런 능력들을 좀더 보여줘야 된다고 생각을 합니다. 그리고 또 하나 한미일 한국과 미국과 또 특히 이번에서 일본은 북한의 핵미사일 발사 시도를 굉장히 빠른 시간 내에 부착해서 어 이걸 인터셉트하거나 또는 사전에 발사를 좌절시킬 수 있는 그런 능력을 개발하는 것이 보다 더 현실적이라고 생각을 합니다. 앞서 설명드렸듯이 제가 야당인데요. 국회에서는 여전히 이제 다소 의석을 가지고 있습니다. 제가 지금은 국회에서 가장 긴 이름의 상임위원회 위원장을 맡고 있는데요. 산업, 통상, 에너지, 그리고 중소기업, 그리고 스타트업 기업 벤처 위원회의 위원장을 맡고 있는데요. 직전까지는 이제 몇주 전까지는 제가 외통위의 부위원장을 맡고 있었습니다. 그래서 한미 동맹 70주년 결의안을 통과시키는 데 있어서 오늘 함께한 우리 김태호 위원장님과 함께 협업을 했었고 한미 동맹의 공고한 역사적 가치와 향후 새로운 도약을 향한 우리들의 인식의 공유는 어, 충분히 있고 의견은 다르지 않습니다. 다만 이번 워싱턴 선언 여러 가지 의미에서 또 평가할 부분은 있지만 어, 그 핵과 관련해서 이야기를 한다면 사실 MPT 체제의 재확인이다. 어, 사실 확인이라는 것이 에너지를 넣는 일은 아니지만 에너지가 필요한 시기가 아니라 이 확인이라는 절차조차도 어, 필요한 시기였다면 그 자체로 의미가 있겠죠. 어, 현재가 뭐였을까요? 대한민국을 들어싸고 있는 핵무장론에 대한 어, 미국 조야의 우려가 바로 그 전에 있었습니다. 그런데 저는 좀이 부분을 이제 좀 섬세하게 들여다볼 필요가 있는데 그 우리 한국의 핵무장론에 대한 국민 여론이 60% 70%대에서 어, 더 상승하고 있다라는 여론이 있는 것은 사실입니다. 그런데 조금 더 자세히 살펴보면요. 굉장히 아이러니한 세부조사 결과가 많습니다. 한국의 군사력이 북한에 비해서 강하다라고 생각하는 응답자의 71.2%가 핵무장을 원합니다. 다시 이야기해서 북한보다 어, 그 무장능력, 우리의 군사력이 부족하다고 생각하기 때문에 핵무장을 원하는 게 아니라는 겁니다. 해석할 지점이 있는 거죠. 그리고 안보 상황이 안정적이라고 어, 평가한 응답자가 오히려 불안정하다고 평가한 응답자보다 핵무장을 원하는 비율이 더 높았습니다. 이 아이러니를 이제 다양한 의견들이 해석을 하는데요. 다양한 해석을 한 데는 다양한 의견들이 있을 수 있는데요. 그 핵무장 선호도가 어, 과연 그냥 단순히 이제 그 숫자가 보여지는 것들을 바로 다이렉트로 이해하고 넘어가서는 안 된다는 지점을 저는 이야기하고 있습니다. 그리고 또 하나 어, 지켜볼 것은 이러한 핵무장에 대한 60%, 70%에 임박한 찬성론들이 정작 MPT 체제를 어, 위반한 결과 우리나라가 감당해야 될 어, 북한의 어, 생션처럼 우리나라가 감당해야 될 어, 세계 시민으로서의 어떤 역할을 저버림으로 해서 감당해야 될 경제적인 타격이나 국익의 훼손의 지점들을 설명을 하고 난 뒤에는 결과가 바뀝니다. 다시 이야기해서 핵무장론에 대한 것은 어 조금 감정적이거나 정서적인 것에 의존했다는 거죠. 논리적 판단의 정보를 제공한 이후에는 한국 국민들은 굉장히 합리적인 판단을 합니다. 
어, 너무 당연한 이야기인데 왜 이런 이제 핵무장론에 대한 어, 한국의 여론이 높아졌고 이것들을 워싱턴 조야에서 인식을 하게 됐을까 보면 이거는 북핵 위기라든지 이런 부분과는 좀 괴를 달리하는 측면이 있는 것 같습니다. 어, 예전에 비해서 MPT 체제에서 기반된 핵 거버넌스가 어, 동북아를 중심으로 굉장히 많이 약화됐다는 생각입니다. 어, 특히 음, 우리 IMP 중거리 핵 전략 조약 같은 경우에 있어서 트럼프 체제에서 이제 미국이 취한 입장이라든지 그리고 어, 뉴스타트 그러니까 신전략 무기 감축 협정 같은 경우 중단된 것 등등의 기반을 했을 때핵 거버넌스가 좀 약화됐고 그리고 또 하나 예전과 같은 한미 동맹에서의 효용감들에 대해서 어, 대한민국 국민들이 우려를 표한다는 겁니다. 이건 여러 가지 사건들이 있는데 음, 아마 이제 조금 전 우리 박간우 의원님께서 기조연설을 하셨을 때 지적하신 것과 같은 IRA 법에서 드러나는 한미동맹은 목표의 지점은 분명하지만 각자의 국익이 다를 수 있는 어떤 지점들에 대한민국 국민들이 조금 우려를 표하기 시작하면서 정작 이제 동맹의 내용에 대해서도 조금씩 불안이 생겼던 건 사실입니다. 저는 그럼에도 불구하고 한미동맹의 균열이 있었다던가 한미동맹이 약화됐다고 생각하지 않습니다. 그리고 그 부분에 있어의 대한민국 국민들의 우려를 어떤 방식으로 충족시켜 줄수 있는 것인가에 대해서는 다시 신뢰를 회복할 수 있는 것인가에 대해서는 우리 최영도 의원님 같은 경우는 이제 핵에 중점을 둬서 생각을 했다면 저는 굉장히 다양한 측면에 대한민국의 이익에 부응되는 동맹국으로서의 상호 정말 호혜적일 수 있는 대등할 수 있는 미국의 태도에서 어, 그, 그런 결과를 얻을 수 있다고 생각합니다. 어, 이번 워싱턴 선언 자체가 사실은 제가 동적이지 않다고 얘기했지만 어, 그런 정적인 재확인이라도 필요했다 그리고 유의미했다라고 제가 최종적으로 평가를 하는 데에는 바로 그런 어, 한미동맹이 예전에 비해서 달라졌던 그리고 미국의 어, 핵거버넌스에 대한 영향력이 약화됐던 여러 가지 상황에 기인한다. 라는 것이 뭐 제가 드릴 수 있는 마지막 결론 같은 평가입니다. Well, thank you for that. Um, let me talk. Let me turn now to um, Sumi Terry, uh, my great colleague here, who's um, been looking at the North Korean threat for a long time. Um, so it strikes me that as successful as the Biden administration has been in building up the relationship with South Korea. Um, The North Korea um, armament at this point is at a point that um, 10 years ago, I think the United States would have viewed as a huge crisis. And yet today, we don't discuss it very much. Um, the theory is that uh, by US estimates, they probably have 60 nuclear weapons. Some in South Korea think it could be as high as 100. Who knows where it is in that region? Obviously, they've been discussing, as we were just talking about, some new capabilities, including solid fuel and underwater uh, launch. So tell us, um, why is it that with a North Korea that has such a larger capability now, we are not viewing this as a great crisis, uh, an immediate crisis that people have to go deal with, but rather something that we can think we can manage and sort of live with? I think it's because we think we ran out of options. I mean, you know, um, there's a sense that there was, we tried everything, right? There was, it goes back 10 years, more than 10 years, right? We start from the Clinton administration. We had a bilateral negotiation, a bilateral agreement, agreed framework of 1994. We had negotiations, we had an agreement that fell apart. You can blame it was Bush administration, access of evil, is at North Korea, 2002, saying on there, Actually, we found out that they were enriching uranium program, uh, uranium uh, enrichment program. They had it on the side during, before, during, and after the agree framework. We had President Bush and the multilateral negotiations, six-party talks process. We had 2005 agreement, 2007 agreement. So it's not like we don't have agreements with North Korea. We tried bilateral. We tried multilateral. That didn't work out. Whole host of reasons. 
We have President Obama. We have strategic patience policy. Two-term strategic patience. We have President Trump. We have maximum pressure, 2017, fire and fury, rocket men on a suicide mission. All of that, sanctions. We finally got China and Russia to do something more in the fall of 2017. Then we had a summitry. We had President of the United States sitting down with Kim Jong-un three times. So if Trump and Kim can't come to some sort of a deal, I mean, so I think there's an exhaustion, number one. And you know, I teach courses at Georgetown and SICE and various different schools and teach Korean politics and I make them write a policy paper and they try to do a North Korea paper. Tell me, like, so it's very easy to criticize and I'm also, you can criticize the Biden administration because they say right now, this is not strategic patience policy. This is not Trump's all or nothing grand bargain policy. Well, what is it exactly? It's kind of like strategic patience part two. And, but it's not to blame this particular administration or the previous administration, because again, I think every administration tried. And it's just not getting there, because North, guess what? North Korea is not giving up nuclear weapons. Last year, they, tried, they tested 70 missiles. Uh, they're ex rapidly expanding, modernizing, diversifying their capability. What used to be a big deal, like intercontinental ballistic missile test in 2017, that was like, wow, that's a big deal. They did it three times. They crossed the red line. Right now, last year, nobody's even blinking an eye. Nobody cares. I know nobody cares because I don't get called to go on a CNN or MSNBC anymore. Like, nobody cares, right? You're not writing me and saying, what's going on? Um, so <laughs> we got, so we, this is the state. And North Korea came out with a nuclear doctrine in the fall that said, not only are we nuclear weapons power for like forever and ever and ever more, but then they came up with this like all these conditions, five conditions where they would preemptively use nuclear weapons. And basically when they feel threatened. But again, what is there to be done besides the sanctions and deterrence? And this is why we have to rely on sanctions, trying to get <coughs> sanctions implementation, which is also then, then we're talking about also now today, the geopolitical environment is not favorable for that because after Russia's invasion of Ukraine and with US-China strategic competition, guess what? China is not implementing sanctions. 2023 is not 2017. We finally got China to do something in the fall of 2017. Right now, we're nowhere with China. China, Russia could not even condemn an ICBM launch last year. So we're not getting help. So from Kim Jong-un's perspective, and the whole world is also distracted by US-China competition, by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. There's a war going on. And by the way, there's not much we can do with North Korea anyway. So I think this is a combination effect. And you know, Kim Jong-un, you know, is sitting there, think about his calculation. Why should he not continue to try to perfect his capability? Because what is the consequence for North Korea? What is the consequence for Kim Jong-un right now? Absolutely nothing. All excellent points. And you're right, we don't cover it as much as we did, and that's as, as, as much my fault, but that, I've been here at the Wilson Center writing a book, so you know, what can I do? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, but Congressman Barrett, this takes me back to a, a really um, sort of central question about Congress's role in all of this. Right. Because um, a few years ago, each one of those launches was the result of, you know, would result in press conferences and condemnations and talk about new sanctions and so forth. And there is a level of fatigue that is built in. And I'm wondering what that tells you at a moment that China, by the Pentagon's own estimates, is moving to probably eight or 900 weapons by 2030, 1500 by 2035, if you believe the Pentagon estimate, that would take them up to about our levels. Um, uh, as uh, uh, we, we heard uh, from our other colleagues, uh, we're watching uh, New START be suspended, and I think nobody here would probably want to bet on it being a, a new agreement coming together. Um, and yet I hear fairly little um, from the Hill on this topic. Uh, and I'm wondering if it is because there's not much to do on the legislative side or if it is because there's just acceptance of a new reality? I think Sumi was um, pretty accurate. That like, we've tried the carrot, we've tried the stick, we've tried multiple different approaches, and we are where we are. Um, and I wouldn't underestimate you know, the, the events of you know, February 2022, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, really changing 
the, the calculus, not just in the region, but across the world. I mean, I'd love to say it was our diplomacy to get Prime Minister Kashida to go to 2% of GDP and security. I think there's a recognition that big country war is possible, unprovoked invasion. I think you see that um, you know, in Korea as well. And, um, and then you know, with Xi Jinping and where he's taking the, the PRC um, in a much more aggressive direction, I think that's really consumed a lot of Congress's focus. With regards to the US ROK, um, and, and the Korean Peninsula, I think the focus has been on strengthening our relationship as opposed to reacting to North Korea. So you do see a lot of activity in Congress on um, our alliance with the ROK, uh, strengthening that. You know, again, the Washington Declaration, I think, is a, is a component of that, you know, getting the trilateral U.S.-Japan ROK uh, alliance to a better place. I think you'll continue to see more interoperability with our militaries. And then again, I think President Yoon, you know, both in his inaugural address as well as his address to, to Congress um, a month ago, talks about a Korea that is no longer just focused on the peninsula, but a Korea that is externally um, facing. And, and that is a different Korea than you've seen in, in the, the prior seven years. Um, and I think that is a Korea that's ready to, you know, both um, assume some of its own security responsibilities, but also take a bigger presence um, on security in the world. You, um, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the war in Ukraine, and here the Korean response has been fascinating. On the one hand, if you talk to American officials, they couldn't be happier with the direct aid that uh, South Korea has provided, mostly 155 millimeter artillery. And yet, when I was in Seoul, no Korean officials actually wanted to go talk about it or admit to it. Um, it makes it a little difficult. How do you build up a near NATO ally if they don't want to talk about their role in the alliance? So I wanted to ask each one of you, but I'll start with you, Congressman, since your time is a little more limited with us. You know, again, um, the fact that they're participating and providing support, I think, is a major step. You know, I, I don't think um, we hold it against them that they're not quite ready to talk so uh, externally um, about that, that commitment. You know, mm -hmm. the, these are steps that they're taking. We recognize that they are part of this global coalition supporting Ukraine, um, that they're doing what they can. You know, they're ramping up their own defense industry as well and, you know, becoming a major exporter and provider of security assistance around the world. So. I, I don't think those of us in Congress see this as a, as a negative. We see it, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that they are participating with us as a positive. And Ms. Lee, since you're in the opposition, has there been much opposition to the, the help that has been provided to, um, to Ukraine? 네, 공식적으로 한국 정부는 우크라이나에 예. 우크라이나에 어, 군사적 지원을 했다라고 인정하고 있지 않습니다. 그것은 어, 단순히 한국 내 여론을 의식해서 많이 문제가 아니라 어, 한국이 가지고 있는 헌법 체제에서 어, 전쟁에 그러니까 그것이 뭐 우리 진영에서 촉발된 것이든 아니면은 방어를 하는 것이든 간에 전쟁에 참여하는 것에 대해서는 어, 굉장히 엄격하게 통제하는 그 헌법적 가치가 있기 때문입니다. 그것에 대한 사회적 컨센서스가 어, 동의되지 않고 또 정부로서도 어, 법적 명분이 없기 때문에 아직 공식적으로 인정하고 있지 않습니다. 어, 그 지점에 대해서는 이제 나토국 같은 경우는 이제 어, 지오폴리티컬 그 지리적으로도 그리고 또 이제 지정학적으로도 러시아와 이제 수탄 히스토리를 공유하고 있고 또 이제 그 침범 의 결과물들을 바로 옆 국가에서 바라보고 있기 때문에 나토국들은 어 본인 국가 이해관계 좀더 가까울 수 있지만 대한민국은 이제 가치적인 측면에 있어서 동의하고 연대할 수는 있지만 그 전쟁을 우리가 자위권을 발동할 정 발, 발동할 정도인가에 대해서는 다 동의하지 않기 때문에 그런 겁니다. 어 아미베라 의원님이나 이제 질문을 하시는 입장에서는 대한민국이 중추 국가로서 역할을 하고 세계 글로벌 질서를 구축하는데 큰 책임감을 갖고 있다는 거는 
뭐 부정하는 사람들은 없습니다. 하지만 이게 군사적 지원으로서 어떤 방식으로 관여되는가의 문제는 대한민국 헌법 그리고 대한민국의 지정학적 어 어떤 독특한 어떤 시츄에이션도 좀 고려를 해서 어 판단을 해 주셔야 하지 않을까 생각합니다. Sumi, what's your view of this um, odd, odd position that the South Koreans find themselves in of being a quite critical ally in a conflict that is not in their region um, have been enormously helpful and don't want to say so? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's complicated, um, as, as um, Representative Lee just talked about. But my position has always been consistent on this, is that Ukraine's situation is not something that's happening over there for South Korea. I feel truly that this is direct consequence to South Korea. Just look at the situation of nuclear armed country invading non-nuclear neighbor. After Ukraine gave up nuclear weapons in 1994, the same year that North Koreans first signed the Great Framework. So to me, this is not what happens, whether Putin prevails or Ukraine prevails. This is not somebody else's business. This is South Korea's int in in interest. So they need to do whatever they can to help, um, just from a s even self-interest perspective, and, and they are. They are it's, 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 they're, there's a little bit complication there. I hope that that can be worked out, but um, we, I also, you know, I agree with Congressman Barr that, you know, it's step by step, let's get their help first. Whether they, if we, they have to be not so vocal about it, the important thing is that they help Ukraine. Um, Congressman Barr, since we only have you for a few more uh, minutes, let me ask you on one other topic, which has to do with the technological competition with China. So the one thing the United States has done, the Biden administration has done, that has sort of most captivated uh, the Chinese and that they complain about the most are the technology restrictions they've done on them. Many of these came out uh, on October 7th. They restricted very high-end semiconductors, things you could use in artificial intelligence, <coughs> but also you could use in weaponry, but also the fundamental manufacturing equipment. These are not sanctions that are designed to be lifted when China changes its behavior. These are designed to uh, help rebuild the semiconductor um, uh, production capability, much of it in your state, that we once had and is now a much smaller portion. Um, the two other countries, three other countries that are critical participants in this are Japan, the Netherlands, where that production equipment is made, and of course, South Korea. Um, what is your assessment of how well the South Koreans have lined up with the U.S. on this? Obviously, given the importance of China as an export market to South Korea, this is as complicated as the Ukraine question? You know, no easy answers. I, I would say the other thing that has given China some heartburn is that we actually passed important bipartisan legislation, the Chips and Science Act, yeah. which again is, you know, as much about rebuilding our research and technology yeah. capabilities. Um, and, you know, obviously there, we're working through some issues, but I think that's, uh, an important signal, you know, companies like Samsung and so forth are making major investments, SK Hynix and, and, and others in the United States. I, I think, um, you know, this technological partnership, you know, Japan, Korea, the United States, Netherlands, and, and you're seeing it throughout the, the European Union, is a recognition of where China's headed. And I, I think it's a direct result of the pandemic. and you know, the supply chain issues and, you know, and, and all the repercussions and a realization of the over-reliance on a single source of, um, you know, supply chains, whether that's semiconductors or rare earth elements, you're seeing a lot of um, individual conversations amongst partners. The one um, sticky point right now is you're, we're watching China take direct aim at U.S. companies like Micron mm -hmm. um, and, and our consulting companies like Bain and, the, and others. Um, you know, those are conversations that are ongoing with the Koreans because, you know, as, you know they take aim at Micron. Do um, South Korean companies step into to that frame, or do we s stand together here? Um, because what is a U.S. company today could be a South Korean company tomorrow. Um, and we've seen 
how China uses economic coercion. Um, you know, obviously, the the Koreans have firsthand experience both the bad deployment, um, as do the Japanese uh, in in prior years. So, I, I think the economic alliance and the economic partnership um, is going to be as equally important as the um, security alliance and security partnership. I think that's probably right. Um, Jay, what do you, what's the view of this in um, South Korea? Uh, pretty delicate, given the fact that China is the overwhelming trading partner now. Uh, and yet, it would be a huge breach with the United States if South Korea was not going along with the technology sanctions.네,바로,뭐,굉장히,어려운문제고,가장,크게고민하는,바로,그부분이라고생각합니다그런데저가볼때는어이게그때특히미국미국의재판같은걸보면은재판정에서실제로일어나는중요한어공방보다는그진실에
그 담화문 국민들에 대해서 말했던 것이 굉장히 인상적입니다. 마치 20년 후에 오늘 상황을 내다본 것 같은 그런 통찰력이 있었는데 이런 내용이 있습니다. 우리가 오늘 한미 FTA를 하는 이유는 장차 중국의 기술 경쟁력이 우리를 앞지르고 해서 우리가 중국에 뒤처질 우려도 있기 때문이다. 그리고 장차 중국과도 FTA 해야 될 것인데 우리가 이 경쟁력을 높여놓지 않으면은 우리가 기술적인 우위에 처하지 않으면은 중국에 뒤처질 것이다. 이런 이야기를 한 적이 있습니다. 그러니까 우리가 처한 상황에서 어 우리는 한국 내에서의 정치적 컨센서스 이런 선택이 불가피한 것이다. 이런 선택은 우리가 미리 예견해야 되는 것이고 지금 우리가 이런 선택을 했기 때문에 중국의 보복을 받는다거나 또는 그것 때문에 우리가 더 나아가야 될 기술적인 그 경쟁력 또 기술적인 선택 기술 동맹으로서 선택에서 주제에서는 안 된다라는 것을 우리 국민과 우리 국회 내에서 빨리 이제 공론을 만들어내는 게 컨센서를 만들어내는 것이 우리 정부 여당의 역할이라고 생각합니다. 예. Great. Well, I know that Congressman Barra has to leave us. I want to thank you very much for joining us, and we'll continue the conversation. Thank you so much. We'll, um, we'll pick this up. Um, and I wanted to go back to um, Sumi and ask her a variant of the same technology question. You know, um, for most of the time that I covered South Korea, while it was a rising technological power, um, we thank, thought of it primarily in security terms. And it's a lot easier to get members of Congress um, to think about building aircraft carriers at $15 billion uh, a piece for the United States than it is um, to convince them to build fabs semiconductor fabs at $15 billion a piece. And so I'm wondering whether or not you see in this new relationship with the kind of investment that we have now seen taking place in South Korea in the US, um, a fundamental shift in which we're going to begin to see much more South Korean production of equipment we consider critical for national security to be here or whether this is going to be more symbolic? I think the first, uh, I see Ambassador Lipper just walked in for the, who's going to be moderating the second panel where they will delve into this very question. Yeah. Um, absolutely the first, I don't think it's symbolic. I think we have shifted. I think this is ties back to our first question about North Korea. When you ask me, why do we not kill? Why do we, why has it slowed down when they're tested 70 nuclear weapons? I think nuclear weapons, oh my God. <laughs> we have for 70 tests. Um, the alliance has, that's of course foundational, like security, North Korea, but really it has now expanded to this whole other thing. It's not just President Yoon with the GPS and global people of state. I think Korean mindset is fundamentally has shifted. It is now 10th largest economy in the world. Korea is not what it used to be. It's not only just peninsula focus. It's not just about North Korea. It has such bigger role. Um, in the technology space, in uh, supply chain resilience, in economic statecraft. You know, at the Wilson Center, Korea Center, I know how many, you know, I don't know much about supply chain resilience. I mean, this is not my topic. You know, in the last year, there are more supply chain resilience, technology competition, cooperation. We have Tammy, we have Ambassador Lipper, we have, oh, the, there were, we had more panels and conferences on that. I don't know, if do we have any on North Korea? Maybe, was it a part of a bigger conference? So that tells you right now where the alliance is headed. Of course, the North Korea peace and security peace will be so important, but I think we have fundamentally moved on to a, a next phase. And I, so just to simply answer your question, it's the first, it's, it's not symbolic. But I would love to also hear uh, from Congresswoman Lee. Congress, please. <웃음> 그 앞서 몇 분들이 말씀 주신 좀 지나간 주제라도 조금 의견을 어, 더 보태고 싶은 게 있는데요. 그 이제 뭐 우리 최영도 의원님이 말씀하신 부분에 또 상당 부분 저도 동의를 합니다. 어, 다만 그렇게 산업 구조가 달라지는 과정 안에서도 분명히 이제 급작스러운 외교적 
어, 정책 변화에 따라서 타격을 입는 영역들이 있고 그와 관련된 생태계에 종사하는 많은 사람들은 어, 삶을 잃는 경우도 많습니다. 그게 대한민국 여론을 조성하는 부분이고 최대한 완만하게 하기 위해서 어, 한미 양 국이 양 정부가 고려해야 될 지점 분명히 있습니다. 그것을 단순히 어, 일루션, 그러니까 환상이라고 보거나 이제 미스 컨셉이라고 어, 인식해서는 안 된다는 생각입니다. 어, 그리고 혐중이라고 하죠. 중국에 대한 거부감이 전세적으로 굉장히 높아지고 있고 또 중국의 비상식적인 어떤 어, 국제 대응에 대해서도 비판 여론이 높고 한국 역시 다르지 않습니다. 그런데 어, 저는 이제 똑같은 수준에서 얘기하는 게 아니라 이제 미국에 대해서도 한국민들이 어, 중국을 경험해 봤는데 중국은 소위 말하는 대국론으로 한국의 이익과는 배치되는 일을 굉장히 이제 무모하게 했던 적이 많은데 어, 미국도 혹시 자국 이익을 위해서 그와 같은 스탠스를 가지는 게 아닐까라고 의심하게 만드는 몇 가지 사건들이 있었습니다. 그것이 바로 사실은 사드 배치 물론 뭐 대북 견제용이다 뭐 대중 견제용이다 이런 논쟁은 차치하고서라도 그것 때문에 한국 산업이 이제 중국의 견제를 통해서 맞닥뜨렸던 건 어, 굉장히 심각했거든요. 당시에 저는 어, 충분히 한미 동맹을 위해서 저는 감수할 수 있는 일이라고 생각은 하지만 그 당시에 어, 미국은 동맹이 감수하는 그런 불이익에 대해서 함께 좀 노력을 해주셨어야 합니다. 어, 새로운 산업에 대한 기술 이전이라든지 조금 더뭐 어, 중국에 대한 어필이라든지 근데 그런 어떤 것도 공주 체제가 없었던 것에 대한 한국인들의 서운함이 여전히 기억 안에 있고 아직 복원되지 않은 어, 내용들이 이제 현실에서 또 어려움으로도 존재하고 있는 게 사실입니다. 그 상황에서 이제 제가 또 언급하지만 뭐 IRA 같은 경우도 어, 우리와 같이 다른 어떤 국가보다 미국과 동맹관계에 있어서는 끈끈한 우리가 어, 왜 이런 대우를 받아야 하나 이 경험은 굉장히 컸습니다. 아직도 한국민들에게는 트라우마죠. 어, 두 번의 경험을 대표적으로 들수 있는데 세 번은 안 됩니다. 정말 그건 미국도 어, 의도치 않았겠지만 그것들이 한국 국민들의 정서에 끼치는 영향들은 사실 어, 간과해서는 안 된다는 생각이고요. 무엇보다 이제 최근에 뭐 한국 기업의 투자가 늘어나고 있는 와중에서도 어 조금 우려스러운 바는 한국 유학생이 어 줄어들고 있고 그 문제는 비단 코로나 때문이 아니라 어 실질적으로 전문직 비자 부분에 있어서 이제 동맹국으로서 한국이 기대하는 바에 못 미치는 지점들이 있는데 그렇다 보니까 한국의 젊은이들이 한국 기업의 해외 투자 특히 미국 투자와 관련해서 함께 진출해서 일할 수 있는 기회를 얻기가 쉽지 않습니다. 미국이 유학을 해서 미국에서 잡을 구하는 것도 쉽지 않은 어, 굉장한 걸림돌이 되고 있는데요. 굉장히 음, 이제 사소한 문제인 것 같지만 어, 이 부분에 대한 섬세한 고려가 우리 어, 강하게 신뢰하는 동맹국으로서 미국 정부로서는 좀 어, 필요해 보입니다. 중국과 관련해서 어쨌든 안정적인 그리고 또 함께 이제 시민적 성숙을 이룬 국가 간에 저는 뭐 같이 같이 동맹 그리고 또 여러 가지 차원에서의 노력들이 뭐 100% 100% 동의하진 않지만 필요성에 대해서는 뭐 다른 의견을 가진 건 아닙니다. 네 거기에 대해서는 추가 의견을 생략하 있습니다. Great. Well, we have about six or seven minutes left. We're going to get ourselves back on, on timing track, but we wanted to be sure to get a couple of questions from the audience. So why don't we take two questions in a row, and then we'll, we'll spread those out. Anybody uh, have an urgent question on their mind here? We have a microphone for you. Okay. Um, oh, yes. One right here. Just wait, wait a moment. A mic is coming. My question is about COVID. Uh, can I ask a question about speech by uh, Congressman Takano? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Can I ask it? 
Well, sure, we, can, we, we can, cannot they can, speak they for can him, respond, but <laughs> yes, but uh, they, they can't speak for him, right? Okay. Uh, he, he mentioned uh, in military-wise, uh, America and Japan and America and Korea, uh, they are doing bilateral, okay? Mm -hmm. They are not doing directly cooperation uh, in military-wise between Korea and Japan. And uh, then uh, he mentioned solution is we should move above history, okay? Mm -hmm. That sounds good, uh, but more persuasive solution is if America try to push Japan to say just, uh, we are sorry, we made a mistake uh, during World War II. If America can devote lots of effort persuading Japanese government or Japanese people to apologize what happened during World War II, then a, a bilateral uh, relationship between Japan and Korea in military-wise will be mo much more effective. So, so I, think, I think we've got, I yeah, think we've we got the essence of the question. Um, Sumi, let me let me oh, ask you. No. This is no, this no, is hardly no, hardly no, new, no, 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 no. hardly new, but um, we have seen this. Uh, we've no. seen the United States ask, be asked to take positions on this for oh, the past God. what forty years, right? At various yes. moments, right? Um, yes. And there's only so much the U.S. can there's do. There's only so much we can do because this really gets to. This has been. I have to tell you. I know where you're going. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you. That's right. Cool. I was just going to say this. This really gets to domestic politics, both at home and in um, South Korea. And frankly, the the meetings between uh, Prime Minister Kishida and President Yoon has been the closest we've seen yes. to solution here, if not full solution, yes. in 40 years. So, as our U.S. policymaker, I will tell you when I was at the NSC. Um, it's not the North Korea problem that is the biggest headache. Yeah. It's this, <laughs> it's this, and it's just not solvable. If you focus on that, it's really not possible to have a forward-looking relationship because it, it just gets stuck. We tried. You know, Secretary Blinken, when he was a deputy uh, he, 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 under Obama, yeah. uh, Secretary of State, tried so hard bringing the Koreans and Japanese together I understand the Korean sentiment. I really, really, really do. And I think this just speaks for the fact, and then you might disagree, um, Congresswoman Lee, but um, this speaks to the fact what President Yoon actually had to do and why this has a domestic backlash. And to me, he made a courageous decision. It's so hard. It's one of the most difficult question and issue domestically. So I'm just going to leave it at that. My perspective is Korea-Japan relationship, working together, improving that relationship is critical. There's so much going on in the region and the world that two like-minded allies working together and growing. So for me, I fully support that, and I support President Yoon's decision. Uh, yeah, you, yes, please. please. Yes. Uh, He's, he's seen this at all sides as a <laughs> former news reporter, yes. as a Kennedy School <laughs> fellow, for which I, I commend yes. him. Uh, so at the I'm, time, I'm, when I was, yes. Now. Yeah. Uh, 선생님 말씀하신 대목에 대해서 미국 의회는 그 문제에 대해서 지적한 적이 있습니다. 제가 2007년에 오시는 특판을 할때 그때 하우스 레졸루션 121을 통해서 미국 의회가 유네니머스를 정말 만장일치로 일본 정부로 하여금 캄프트문 이슈에 대해서 사과하고 교육하라고 했습니다. 아마 그런 그건 오히려 미국 의회가 어, 어떻게 보자면 일국의 그 내정에 관한 문제인데 굉장히 어, 유례가 없을 정도로 강하게 했습니다. 그리고 그 기록은 남아 있습니다. 미국 의회는 저는 할 도리를 했다고 생각을 합니다. 그리고 이제 우리 차례가 왔는데. 최근에 가장 긍정적인 변화가 있었습니다. 일본의 요미우리 신문이 요미우리 신문이 중도 보수입니다. 그러니까 센트럴 컨서버티브인데 어, 지난 몇년 사이에는 굉장히 한국에 대해서 조금 
거리를 두었고 한국의 태도에 대해서 못마땅해 하는 언론이었습니다. 이론의 가장 큰 신문이죠. 그런데 한일 간에 굉장히 가슴 속에 응어리진 또 다른 문제는 칸토 대지진 때, 관동 대지진 때 한국 사람들이 일본 사람들에게 희생양이 됐다는 굉장히 억울한 그 스토리가 있습니다. 그게 바로 애플 TV에서 어, 한번 상영했던 파친코의 중요한 테마이기도 했습니다. 근데 여기에 대해서 최근에 요미루 신문이 어, 프론트 페이지에 풀 페이지로 칸토 대지진에 대해서는 일본이 잘못했다라고 굉장히 놀라운 기사를 실었습니다. 이게 이제 한일 간의 역사 문제들 새롭게 지금 움직이고 나가고 있는 하나의 징표라고 생각합니다. 어, 양국 간의 관계, 특히나 피해국과 어, 가해 국가의 관계에 있어서도 이것이 도메스틱 다 도메스틱 폴리틱스에 좌우되기 때문에 참 쉽지가 않습니다. 쉽지 않은데 저는 이때야말로 좀 대담한 외교가 필요한데 결국에는 상사국 간의 국민의 마음을 얻으려는 외교가 굉장히 중요하다고 생각합니다. 그런데 서로가 어, 양국의 지도자나 양국의 정치인들이 자국민의 국내 정치에 어, 거기에 호소해서 그걸 강화하는 식으로 가면 은그 풀리지 않을 텐데 국내에서 큰 부담이 있었지만 윤석열 대통령이 일본에 대해서 마치 그것은 20년 30년 전에 김대중 대통령이 오부치 총리에 대해서 했던 그런 대담한 접근을 통해서 우리가 접근을 했기 때문에 일본으로서도 아 그렇다면 우리는 굉장히 한국에 대해서도 우리가 해야 할 도리를 해야겠다고 해서 나온 것이 바로 요미리 신문의 그큰 일면 보도였습니다. 최근에 일본 내에서는 우리 한국에 대해서 한류 케이팝이나 또 케이드라마 또 케이푸드에 대해서 굉장히 호감을 갖고 있는 사람이 많았지만 지난 수년 동안 한일 관계가 굉장히 얼어붙으면서는 그 일본 사람조차도 한국 좋다는 이야기를 못했습니다. 그런데 지금 다시 일본 내에서 한국의 매력에 대해서 이야기하는 사람이 생기고 있고 이 그런 것들이 한일 관계의 새로운 발전을 이루어낼 거라고 봅니다. 그것이 아마도 우리 국내에서 이렇게 이야기합니다. 지금 미국 정치도 마찬가지고 일본 정치도 마찬가지고 모든 민주주의 국가의 정치를 보면 은 어떻게 말을 해도 30%는 무조건 이 편입니다. 어떻게 말을 해도 30%는 무조건 저 편입니다. 확실한 콘크리트로 붙어 있습니다. 그러면 40% 정도가 사실은 큰 진실을 좌우할 거라고 봅니다. 바로 서로 중도적으로 바라보고 객관적으로 바라볼 수 있는 그 40% 상대의 국민을 상대로 한 그런 좀더 대담한 어떤 이해 접근 노력 이런 것들이 한일 간의 어려운 역사 문제도 풀수 있고 우리가 일본 만화를 좋아하고 또 때때로 일본의 일본을 여행하는 것을 좋아하는 것처럼 일본 사람들도 한국에 대해서 한국의 음식 한국의 노래를 매우 좋아하고 한국 영화도 좋아합니다 한국 드라마도 좋아하고 그런 것들을 이제는 서로 혐한 또 우리 혐일 반일이 아니라 그런 건뭐 기본적으로 역사적 베이스 때문에 불가피한 측면이 있지만 이제는 좀더 앞서 나가려는 서로에 대한 좀더큰 매력을 가지고 어, 또 분명한 사실은 지금 일본은 과거 군국주의자들이 지배하는 나라가 아니고 한국 역시도 어, 과거의 그런 그 이제 왕조 시대가 아닙니다. 이제는 모든 국민들이 선거를 통해서 대통령을 뽑고 총리를 뽑고 국회의원을 뽑는 시기에 양국 국민들 그 선거를 하는 국민들이 서로 당사국 국민들에게 좋은 영향을 미칠 수 있도록 중요하고 특히 미국에 대해서도 우리 어, 이재정 의원이 말씀하셨지만 미국 국민들 미국 정부도 한국 국민들에게 좀더 세심한 배려 예컨대 한국 젊은이들이 미국을 좋아합니다만 미국에 와서 지직하기 힘듭니다. 한국 국민들은 매우 우수하고 미국 사회에 큰 영향과 좋은 기회를 할수 있는데도 취업할 기회가 적어집니다. 이건 굉장히 엄폐하다고 생각합니다. 그런 것처럼 좀 국민을 상대로 한 어떤 퍼블릭 디플로머시 중요성이 날로 커지고 그것이야말로 역사 문제를 해결하는 방법이 아닌가 생각합니다. 짧게 1분만. Very briefly, we're already yeah. over time, so if we can just do it within one minute. Yeah, yeah, 좋습니다. 네, 어, 한미일 코퍼레이션은 이야기할 수 있지만 한미일 얼라이언스는 절대 불가능할 거거든요. 사실 어, 그것을 위해서도 넘어야 되는 산입니다. 어, 아쉬운 점은 일본이 그렇게 눈부신 경제 성장을 하고도 글로벌 리더로 나서기가 어려웠던 건 독일과 달랐기 때문이죠. 어, 독일의 총리가 무릎을 꿇을수록 어, 독일의 위상이 더 높아졌다는 얘기가 있습니다. 정말 일본이 어, 
자랑스러운 국가로 도약하기 위해서 필요했던 절차인데 어쨌든 생략됐고 지금으로서는 한일 양국의 이해관계가 아니라 그 부분에 있어서 만큼은 방향은 명확하고 하지만 한꺼번에 해결될 수 없는 어떤 상황들이 있다면 이 부분은 당분간이라도 투트랙으로 갈 수밖에 없습니다. 피해자에게 어, 그 부분을 잊으라 이제 해결됐다라고 탑다운 방식으로 해결될 수 없는 건 자명합니다. 다만 이 투트랙을 어떻게 관리하는지가 어, 정치인으로서 그리고 또 지금 윤 정부로서의 어, 과제가 아닐까 생각합니다. Great. 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 Well, I want to thank all the members of our panel, um, Sumi Terry and both of our, our guests from South Korea, and uh, of course Congressman uh, Barra, who had to, uh, Barra who had to leave us uh, here a little bit early, and we look forward to the next panel after a very short coffee break. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ready to go? All right, ready to go. All right, well, thanks. After a scintillating uh, first panel that I had the uh, honor of sitting through, uh, we are on to panel two, which we hope and expect will be every bit uh, the barn burner that panel one was, and uh, looking forward to a really, really excellent conversation on what I think is arguably um, one of the most dynamic parts of the alliance, the relationship uh, between the United States and the Republic of Korea. And uh, really, it is something that I would just say quickly at the outset here, near and dear to my heart, um, the future of what is the, well, excuse me, the, the panel is officially titled The Future of the ROK-US Alliance Redefining Security Through Trade and Technology. And this is something, as I was saying, near and dear to my heart. Um, we, I was giving speeches about this in 2015 in Korea, a, a New Frontiers speech. Uh, it took, you know, uh, I, I was ineffective at implementing it because here we are uh, eight years later still talking about it. I'm kidding. But it really has exploded. And it has its own term in Korea, Kyungjae Anbo, uh, economic security. And it is really taken off across a range of sensitive technology, manufacturing, supply chain, trade issues. You name it, this issue is in it. And it is really, really important. So as we feel our way through this, uh, in really a, with a lot of alacrity and speed, we are, we are tackling new contours in the alliance, new institutions, um, and to help us make sense of this, we have assembled the Wilson Center uh, and our good partners from Korea uh, have assembled a, a really an all-star panel to, to walk us through this issue. And let me just quickly introduce uh, this, this panel and their and their bios uh, left to right. I'm just, look them up in your panel. I'm not gonna go through them all, but first we have Miss Tammy Overby. Everybody who's stepped foot in Korea uh, in the economic and commercial field knows Tammy. She is a senior advisor at the Albright Stonebridge Group, former senior vice president of Asia at the U.S. Cham Chamber of Commerce, also long time head of AmCham uh, in, in Korea as well. So Tammy, welcome. Next, we have Mr. Mark Kennedy, a director of the Wahaba Institute of Strategic Competition, former member of the United States House of Representatives, Minnesota's second and sixth congressional districts. And I found out that um, while he was never my member, I did live in his district uh, for a, a brief period of time in Minnesota, my family did. And he's also, I think, a proud graduate of St. John's University, go Johnnies. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Teho Park. Uh, Professor Emeritus, GSIS, Seoul National University, President Lee & Co. Global uh, Commerce Institute, and perhaps most uh, notably known for being the former Minister of Trade of the Republic of Korea. And last but certainly not, not least, local here in town, Mr. Young Jae Kim. He's the Economic Minister of the Embassy of the Republic of Korea to the United States. And two points, if you look in his bio, a range of postings around the world doing all sorts of extraordinary service on behalf of the Republic of Korea. And also, I should just say, um, your, your position there, uh, Mr. Kim, has great lineage. Uh, people go on to great things, uh, undersecretaries, minister posts. So uh, um, we know that uh, this is just a stop on the way up the, uh, the ladder uh, in, uh, inside the government of Korea. So let's get into it, as they say. And I'm going to come to uh, Minister Park first. And just to ask him, we, we have talked. This is a new and emerging issue in terms of at least the salience that 
this technology and trade relationship has taken on uh, here recently between our two nations. That said, the economic relationship between the United States and Korea is decades old, and it's evolved. So can you just briefly walk us through a little bit about where we have come to, where we have come from, and where we are heading to to kind of get the panel off rolling in the right direction? Thanks again, Minister. Is it on? Uh, it is on. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Lippert. Uh, good to see you again. We briefly talk about baseball in Korea. He's rooting for Tucson uh, uh, very uh, enthusiastically. Anyway, uh, thank you for uh, East Asia Foundation and the Wilson Center for inviting us to this uh, very important uh, panel. Uh, as the uh, moderator said, I will start with uh, a brief uh, uh, review of our uh, economic and trade relations uh, between Korea and uh, United States. So looking back on the 70th uh, anniversary of Korea-US alliance from economic and trade uh, perspective, uh, the most important thing is that the uh, uh, US is the uh, key factor, uh, key contributor to the Korea's uh, successful economic uh, development, uh, which is really emphasized on trade, mainly export. So US uh, have provided excellent uh, export market for the Korean products uh, in the early stage of economic development and help uh, keep the multilateral trading environment open so that we uh, could be very successful. Uh, I just uh, saw the, some figures uh, in the 70s and 80s. Our export to United States accounted for, on average, more than 30%. In late 70s, it went up to 40 45 uh, percent, and then it declined all the way down to 10 uh, percent uh, in 2011, right before we uh, implement the uh, Coros FTA. And since then, uh, our trade with the United States is gradually increasing. So now uh, we have a Coros FTA started in uh, March uh, 2012 when I was doing uh, trade minister. We started uh, this uh, excellent. Uh, kind of uh, uh, agreement. Let me just say uh, about Korea right now. Um, last year, Korea has become the 10th largest uh, economy in the world. It's well known in terms of GDP. And uh, Korea's total export and uh, total trade are ranked sixth in the world, respectively. So Korea, in terms of trade, Korea is a huge country. And uh, Korea is the key G20 uh, country, uh, member country, and uh, Korea was invited to uh, the G7 summit meeting uh, in the last two years in a row. Uh, as you know uh, very well, Korea's uh, global companies, I don't want to name, you know, Hyundai is of course included, but uh, uh, they are investing heavily in the U.S. and in, the, in Europe uh, recently. So as a uh, uh, you know, uh, report mentioned, uh, what about the future? Let me just start with a, a very brief uh, statement, and then uh, maybe you can discuss it later for other things. Both uh, two consecutive uh, summit meeting between uh, our President Yoon and President Biden actually upgraded the bilateral alliance uh, to the Global Comprehensive Strategic Alliance, which is the highest level of alliance. So we welcome that. And uh, what does that mean? Uh, we broaden the scope of cooperation, uh, not only from a bilateral one, but uh, we expand our relation to a, a regional one and also global one. So we are uh, addressing the, uh, these issues together. For example, uh, peaceful use of uh, nuclear energy as a global issue and supply chain crisis response network in terms of regional cooperation in uh, Indo-Pacific economic, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific area, uh, and also, uh, Bilaterally, uh, we established you know, the next uh, generation critical and emerging technology dialogue between uh, security advisors. So we are really uh, doing fully fledged kind of cooperation in, in uh, uh, many uh, issues as a very mature uh, democratic leaders in the world. Uh, so I mean, uh, I, I, was sh I should say that uh, recently we really established excellent foundation uh, for the future alliance for the another 
70 years uh, of our, our alliance. But at this moment, I want to emphasize that it is more important to effectively implement the various agreements we made uh, and produce actual uh, uh, meaningful results uh, through many diverse uh, channels, including this kind of uh, seminar too. So uh, I'll just stop here. I mean, that just give you an overview of our, of our relationship from the past to the now. All right. Uh, not only have the U.S. and Korea established an excellent foundation. <coughs> Minister, you've given us a great foundation for the panel to get us off and running. Um, Tammy, what, let me come to you next, and let's take the broad framework that the minister has outlined and narrow it a bit um, <coughs> into what I would call the hot topics bucket, right? And I would say I think most people want to talk about these really sensitive uh, technologies, uh, as it were. Um, let me n name a few of them. Uh, electric ve vehicle battery, uh, biologics, display, 5G network issues, and of course, semiconductors, right? Um, so walk us through, within this context that the minister laid out, you've got this framework of US ROK cooperation. Where are we on these sensitive technology uh, discussions? Can you identify some of the areas we're cooperating and a little bit of the, the tension points that might emerge? And as, as someone who is a practitioner in this space, what should we be doing? What should we be thinking about it as an alliance? Tammy, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Mark. I should say Miss Overby. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, well, I'm, not, I'm not, going not, with Mark, yeah, okay, so there we you can go. go with Tammy. <laughs> all right, excellent. Um, first of all, Ambassador, thank you for that very, uh, very comprehensive layout. I'll also make the point that America only has three free trade agreements in Asia. We have one with Singapore, with Australia, but South Korea. And I would argue that the chorus... Uh, the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement is among the most robust, comprehensive, high standard agreements, probably the only one that uh, maybe is a little more advanced, and it's because it was more recently upgraded, was the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement. Uh, but in Asia, CHORUS is the name of the game. And I think that has given us an incredible framework uh, to be able to work together in areas um, where, frankly, in technologies that the world is looking at. Um, you know, Mark mentioned electric vehicles. Um, uh, that, well, when you, someone says EV, I think Hyundai or Kia. Uh, when somebody says EV batteries, I think SK On. I think LG Chem or LG uh, ES. Um, you know, um, displays, you know, I think Samsung, uh, I think LG, 5G, I think Samsung, I think LG, semiconductors, I mean, you know, basically you're thinking Korean, major Korean companies. Um, before we implemented the Chorus Free Trade Agreement, our trade relationship was a bit more contentious. When I first moved to Seoul in 1988, the members of the American Chamber of Commerce used to say, Korea, one of the hardest places to do business in Asia. When I moved from Korea back to the US in 2009, American companies said Korea, best place in Asia to do business. Mm -hmm. And the reason, I believe, was that foundation of the Chorus FTA. And again, I think, um, you know, where are we going forward? Where, where, what are the opportunities? Well, we see a lot of joint ventures between major Korean and American companies, both in Korea, but also more and more in the US. Uh, for example, Hyundai Motors is in a joint venture with a US autonomous driving company in Boston. Um, there are Korean um, biologic companies in joint ventures with major American pharmaceutical companies. So um, I think uh, the opportunity to work together in, from my perspective, and again, I've been doing Asia for over, you know, maybe 35 years now, um, the U.S. and South Korean economies are very complementary. Of course, you know, we, we sometimes compete, but we compete on a level playing field, and more often than not, we compete and find a way to work together. Uh, and with that, I'll stop and let you move on. All right. Thanks, Tammy. Great stuff there. Let me come uh, to uh, Congressman Kennedy. Uh, Congressman you serve as director of the Wilson Center's um, Wahaba Institute. I'm probably not pronouncing Waba. that right. Wahaba, uh, excuse <laughs> me. Um, and what the, the charter here, at least according to the bio, is 
You're dedicated to strengthening America's alliances and the technology, trade, infrastructure, and energy foundations of the economic and global leadership. So this piece of how we are going to work together uh, between the United States and the Republic of Korea on these, what I would call, sensitive technologies is right in your, your alley. I think that's point one. Point two, then, to the question is, wh while we're trying to get more effective in terms of strengthening our domestic, um, I guess, industries here in the U.S., right? We're trying to rebuild some of these core manufacturing and sensitive technologies in the U.S. How do we then, what's the appropriate role for partners, allies? And to Tammy's point, we do have industries that do compete with each other. How do you try to make sense of this while you're strengthening America's own competitiveness while also working with really important friends, partners, and allies that have some of these really critical core technology and manufacturing capabilities, Congressman? Well, the way I would view it then is that we are in a strategic competition, U.S. and our allies, South Korea is certainly included within that, with uh, rivals that are, for the first time since we fought with the U.K. for independence, uh, a peer rival. If you just take the PRC and the U.S. economically, uh, militarily, increasingly diplomatically, they are becoming increasingly our peer. We have, for most of my life, had what I'll call an overmatch. We've always been bigger than our rival uh, by some margin. The only way that we keep that overmatch if the U.S. acts in tandem with our allies. So our alliances are our, our competitive advantage. So however we act, uh, we need to do it more closely, more tightly with our allies. So if you take, for example, the rebuilding our, our strength at home uh, as manifested in things like Inflation Reduction Act that, that left South Korea on the side, we pay a penalty in terms of that strategic competition for the increased frictions with South Korea Frankly, one I don't think we needed to have paid. So yes, we need to rebuild our own strength here. Yes, we need to uh, understand what we need in the U.S. for our own security purposes, but we ought to be very careful with uh, how that uh, harms our allies. I think it's going to become even more difficult, though, because when I was young, the U.S. Department of Defense uh, was 36% of the globe's, the whole world's research and development was U.S. Department of Defense. Now it's 3%. And uh, so the U.S. Department of Defense has gone from being a net exporter of innovation to an importer of innovation. And so today, the only way we keep that sort of edge that we've always had, that we've relied on, and that we've been respected for, is by adapting commercially driven technology quicker than our rivals. And so that's really the genesis of the restrictions on the high-end telecommunications, uh, high-end semiconductor manufacturing, is, is from a security perspective. The challenge for us in the U.S. is to keep it at just what we need from a security perspective. The challenge we have with our friends like South Korea, as I read, they perceive that as economically driven. And sometimes we talk about it as being economically driven. If we do economic res restrictions, we're going to have a hard time having those strong alliances, we need to keep those restrictions very close. And we need to, I mean, I think, uh, I, I view the IRA came together so quickly, and frankly, surprisingly. I mean, uh, Senator Manchin had a last minute pivot, and then they just got it through and were surprised it happened. I can say, speaking from Congress, normally what happens is that when something like that's going through, you have a longer time, and the administration will come in and say, hey, you need to give me some exit clauses here for how I deal with my good friends from South Korea. And regrettably, that bill came so quickly that those exit you know, clauses uh, weren't put in there. So we have some difficulties, but the difficulties would be us to keep any restrictions specifically to military needs so that, as the phrase goes, you're not obligated to sell the rope that you they can hang you with, uh, that kind of standard, but we also need uh, our friends from South Korea, that when we have those restrictions uh, to partner with us, and, and we need to be a bit more sensitive as we're rebuilding at home, not to have that harm our very strong 
allies. All right, outstanding. Let, let me let me do one follow up before I come to Mr. Kim there at the end. Um, the follow up is well. First, I should say, as a former staffer, uh, at, at ten years on the, on Capitol Hill, I have been sitting there with piles of paper late at night on the Appropriations Committee, saying, "Oh my gosh, are we going to mess this up?" Uh, you know. So I, I know of what you speak. And there is, uh, there is some, uh, let's put it this way, some fidelity to those remarks uh, from a staff point of view. Um, th the question that I have is then, what's the right balance of industrial policy versus letting market forces run in all of this, right? And because to your point, and Ash Carter's book, former Secretary of Defense, talks about used to be the Pentagon produced, or at least sort of it's the, the U.S. industrial base produced a lot of the technology kept it close, and then exported it over time. Now it's more off the shelf commercially, and to your words, how fast can you implement it into your uh, systems is the name of the game. There's a lot of market mechanisms in there, and that's a great strength of the United States. At the same time, you've got the U.S. in industrial policy in a big way, and a, a seasoned government in the Republic of Korea who's, who's very good at industrial policy, and there's questions However, should that model be updated? So how are you thinking about industrial policy, market mechanisms, that mix uh, in this really important dynamic environment? Well, I think we have a lot of talk about industrial policy, which, as you mentioned, evidence sporadically America has not done. And, and I think the best way of viewing this is sporadic. Uh, we did an IRA. We did a CHIPS Act. Anybody who thinks we're going to be doing a lot more industrial policy, just look at the, the deficit that we're running and the big challenge we had with our, our debt limit and the fact that, oh, by the way, that was just deferred until the first month of the next presidency. So we're not going to be putting huge sums of public money into subsidies. We're going to hopefully make what we've done work and, and have it be effective. But we also uh, need to benefit more from embracing the markets. America has always been known to perhaps embracing markets more than any other major economy, and, and that has to return. And as we think about this whole economic, uh, economic security with our, our partners, the military will tell you they're feeling our absence in trade, our absence in leaning forward in markets in the region, and that we're relying too much on the security side <coughs> of it as opposed to the economic side of it. And when you think about how we truly achieve economic security together, it's not just us trading with more, each other more, but us together trading with Southeast Asia more and, uh, and other friends. So right now we're kind of in a, in a delusional dream that we can retreat from markets, that we can not be leaning forward on trade. You mentioned, uh, uh, Minister, that uh, our market access helped you grow into an economy. Mm -hmm. And that's made you a big, strong friend of America that we are stronger for. Uh, we have those same opportunities. We benefited, by the way, during that whole period. Uh, we have the same opportunities to lean more into the trade agenda than we have. And uh, right now, the American people aren't against that. It's somehow we've gotten this belief within the political class in D.C. that we can't do it. So somehow we just need to break that fever and move forward. So. Uh, I'm strongly on the belief that we're not doing enough on the market side of that. Okay, absolutely. Great, great point there, uh, Congressman. Bookmark that. I want to come back to the trade discussion here before we, before too long. Uh, let, let me go to Mr. Kim. Mr. Kim, you are the representative of the South Korean government up here on the panel. I wanted to uh, get the conversation flowing before coming to you because I wanted to have you have the ability to comment on any number of these interventions. So feel free to come back on anything that the panelists have said. The, the question that I would just put to you is a, is, is a broad one, right? In terms of the alliance, you do have a couple of different competing threads that we've identified. One, as uh, Mr. Park um, outlined, really strong framework and direction. Number two, you do have the looming competition with China, which puts our allies in, I wouldn't say awkward positions, but puts them in, in, in positions where they have to make uh, sometimes difficult choices. Uh, not always, but, but sometimes. And three, um, this, the Buy America piece and the market access piece that Congressman Kennedy identified. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Kim, the floor is yours, and please, uh, we're really looking forward to your comments. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I will get to that, but the people that I may start uh, started uh, about these nice photos on our sites. We had a, such a great uh, state visit in, in April. It's already been two months ago, but this event is recalled this week by another state visit uh, this week, and everybody is wondering <laughs> what kind of personal uh, talent the Prime Minister uh, <laughs> will show in, in tonight's uh, state dinner. Right. Um, so American Pie, you I think it <laughs> no, yes or no? It's been taken. Okay, been taken, all right. I'm, I'm bringing up this topic because two, two reasons. Uh, first, uh, Korea-U.S. relationship. Korea-India relationship or U.S.-India relationship is, is in such a great state. Um, you know, um, President Yoon uh, made a joke in, in his speech at Congress. Uh, uh, BTS beat him to, uh, to White House, but he beat them to Congress. Now we, uh, Korea and, the, and, and India, as back-to-back -back state visit to, to, to the United States, that means how great, you know, how important uh, is our, our relationship in three, um, three countries altogether. The second thing, this is imp important because if you indulge me for a moment, uh, President Yoon made another impressive speech uh, a, a few uh, uh, days ago, this time in Paris, uh, as a last speaker of, of Korea's uh, presentation uh, to members of Bureau of International Exposition uh, to host a 2030 World Expo in Busan, not Tucson, Busan. <laughs> um, so this is a very important international campaign this year for the Korean government. We, we are making the whole of the government uh, effort to, to garner the support from the members, member countries, incre including the United States. Um, uh, and, and Mr. Leeport, uh, when you introduced uh, me, uh, you mentioned uh, this bureaucratic ladder, but you, you skipped the part that I, I uh, uh, in the past, I worked for free trade and investment. Uh, in other words, dismantling uh, barriers to trade, together with uh, then Trade Minister Park. And these days I'm working you know, mostly on a substantively a different set of issues in the name of economic security. But uh, let me start with, with, with the basics. Uh, uh, Professor Park uh, already covered us, uh, some of the important aspects. But uh, there is important change in, in the landscape of trade and environment relationship with, with Korea, uh, between Korea and the United States. So here are some ballpark figures. As you, as you will remember, the core safety took into effect in tw uh, 2012. And for the last 10 years, the trade volume between uh, Korea and the United States has doubled from 100 billion to almost 200 billion in 20, uh, 20 uh, second. Uh, it's like Moore's law in, in cheap performance, <laughs> only the, the span was longer. In terms of the uh, investment, um, $100 is the number the President Biden uh, said as an amount the Korean companies have invested in, in the United States for the <coughs> last two and a half years since he took office. So that means 30 to 40 billion dollars a year. Now, uh, if we bring in the China factor here, in 80s and 90s, the, the United States has always been Korea's number one trading partner. But China took over this place early 2000s. Mm. Coincidentally or not, right after its accession to WTO in, 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 in 2001. So this change was not <coughs> intentional, um, not by artificial means, such as government policy to promote uh, a trade with certain countries. But uh, this was the only the result of the adaptation of the businesses to the change of the global economic environment. At the peak time, China took 25% of Korea's overall trade volume. And this was greater than the sum of our trade with the United States and Japan. This is rela related to over-dependence issue and this is very important issue in, in, in economic security agenda. Maybe we, we'll have time to, to get to that. But recently, there is an important change. Uh, China's uh, you know, share in, in Korea's trade is decreasing from 25% to 20%. And the uh, trade uh, volume with the US is rising from 15% upward. So at some point in next year, uh, in next few years, the lines will cross and the, the, the United States will retake Korea's number one trading partner's position. Mm -hmm. 
a great uh, development <coughs> in the relationship between our two countries and the relationship with China. So that's one thing I would like to share. Now turning to these uh, important economic security issues, first, um, it's hard to define the concept and delimit the scope. There are, because there are you know, big issues, small issues, every, every issues these days are economic security issues. But, but there are useful reference uh, from uh, Japan and Europe re recently. Japan enacted uh, Economic Security Promotion Act la last year, and the European Union just uh, earlier this week announced their version of economic security strategy. So they, they classify those economic security issues in, in four categories, respectively and largely overlapping. The first one is resilience of supply chain, including energy security. So this is about price surge, unavailability of critically needed products, and this is about concentration of supply chain and over-reliance on, 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 on certain countries. So uh, we had a real life case uh, for this, uh, the shortage of legacy chips or uh, hitting hard the global you know, um, auto industry, for example. And that had a chain reaction that affected the transportation, that affected the distribution as a consequence. So contributing the overall inflation. For Korea, we had a real life uh, case, of, of fam a famous case of, of urea solution. This is used as, as a, diesel, uh, a diesel exhaust fluid. And the insufficient uh, supply of this fluid drove the whole country into panic. Uh, this is really extreme, but this is, a, a, as I said, real life case that's happening. The second economic security issue is, is a security of critical infrastructure, both physical and cyber. And third, technology security and protection from technology leakage, that's the, that's the most important issue. And Japan, uh, uh, Japan's strategy divided this, in, this into two aspects. First one, promote R&D of, of key technology sectors that's related to this industrial policy, newly emerging industrial policy you just mentioned. Second one is non-disclosure of selected patent application. That's the Japanese approach. But American approach is, uh, is a little different. This is much more related to export control and investment screening inbound, outbound. Now, the last piece, uh, European Union added one more thing. That's a newly emerging uh, economic security issue. That's uh, what the scholars call weaponization of interdependence. That's, uh, that's related to dependence on, uh, on, on economic coercion. Uh, we have a, a recent case for, uh, about this. Uh, these are the topics that, that both governments are working every day behind the doors, sometimes in public, or mostly in behind the doors. Thank you. All right, Altsin, let me come back on one follow-up question because that was a really comprehensive laydown and I was taking copious notes. Let me just uh, come back from panel one. Uh, Mr. Sanger, and I don't want to put words and speak for him, but he seemed to uh, intimate or at least suggest that you've got, you still, notwithstanding the, the, the lines of the trade relationship between China and Korea, U.S., Korea are on, uh, on different trajectories, still a big trading partner. It's close. It's in the neighborhood. There's a long history uh, between the two countries. And there's sort of the suggestion out there that China's economic clout and leverage over uh, Korea has made Korea less uh, willing to come along on some of these uh, sanctions, which I, I don't think they're actually sanctions, they're more export controls than sanctions, uh, but on some of these policies. Can you just clarify for the record um, in terms of the South Korean government's thinking on this? Does the South Korean government comply with U.S. Uh, export control policy? Uh, does um, the South Korean government, are they in a deep conversation with the U.S. government on these issues on how to, to best deal with the, these technologies that dovetail with some of the uh, four prongs and pillars that you outlined in your very, very interesting and comprehensive address? Right. Uh, yes, indeed, we have very deep uh, dialogue with the U.S. government. But um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether how, how deeply I can discuss this issue. <laughs> you know, transparency is, is absolutely important value, but sometimes when the discu discussions go public, it's just, it, this is oversimplified, and then sometimes they distort the whole story. I, I never those, encountered that in my yes, career in government. Those, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> 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 those response control issue and economic coercion issue recently, 
you know, this is, uh, you know, <coughs> when this becomes a, a political propaganda, it, it distorts, you know, China, Chinese uh, government, you know, harass a certain, certain country and a certain company, what, what are we all our allies and partners are doing about, about this? This is a two, two uh, the si simplified question. Number one, there is a very complicated uh, aspect of this. First one we, we must consider is opaqueness of, of Chinese policy. You know, we experienced uh, uh, Chinese uh, policy against uh, Korean interests when we deployed American missile system in back in, in five years ago. Now, when they banned, uh, you know, Chinese group tour to Korea, when they, they banned Korea, Korean cultural content in, in Chinese market, they never published, they never announced their intention, you know, their measures. They, o they only did this secretly. But this time, when they, uh, you know, took measures against a certain uh, American company, they announced it. That's very big difference. Why, why, they, why did they uh, announce this? This is, uh, you know, uh, some kind of messaging. And then we have to carefully measure what will be the real impact because they, they at this time, they didn't reveal how much the, the, the scope of the, their ban on these uh, American products. So we have to measure the actual impact on, on, on the Chinese measure and then how the uh, other, other uh, countries and then companies will react on this. Second, um, as you said, there are the relationship between, between you know, um, among countries. Um, this is a famous 3C policy of the US, of US government to, to, to China. That's uh, confrontation, you know, uh, competition, and collaboration. Thinking about Korea and the US, we don't really confront each other because uh, as uh, Dr. Kennedy said, uh, last year we were on the brink because the whole national, uh, uh, is a national eruption in Korea because of IRA issue. But we could manage those difficult issues uh, fairly well. But Korea and the United States, without confrontation, but we still compete you know, as a rest, co uh, collaborate. And there are very competitive relationships among our industries. Our industrial policy, how to uh, induce investment in our domestic you know, soil, you know, in, our, in American soil, in, in, in Korean soil, how to induce foreign um, investment in our soil. We compete you know, by tax credit and by giving a generous subsidy. We compete, <coughs> and our industries, car industry, semiconductor industry, they compete. So how we manage our competition with each other we just let the free market work. That, 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 that's the story in, in, in 10 years ago. And then we, we had to do, do something about this, about, about our competition. And you mentioned the export control. control. Um, so what's going on here is, is, is uh, it's a difficult. Uh, is that the, the issue as, uh, as of now is the extension of this preferred uh, treatment of the US uh, export <coughs> control uh, against uh, China. I mean, preferred uh, uh, treatment to the multinational companies operating within China. So the principle is, uh, this is a matter of principle, we need to uh, be very precise when, when, we have, have, when we take an, an action against China. It is managing the blast radius. And, uh, we have to target the cancer cells only <coughs> without uh, damaging the benign cells we, uh, you know, you know, around the cancer cells. That's the principle. And, and, then, and, and then, as I said um, earlier, uh, we have a, a, a rough agreement on this principle, and both governments are working on uh, how to do this. What's going on is the process to find a way for another. So that's not very important at, at, at this moment. We agree on this principle, and there will be a, a solution, and we, we can, we, we can uh, make the solution in, jointly. Okay. okay, thanks for that. And, I will say, listening to your remarks, it sounds like a targeted approach which you're advocating is not inconsistent with what you hear uh, folks in the U.S. administration talking about small backyard high fence. Um, Mr. Park, floor is yours. Can please, I, yeah, please. Yeah. Can I add something on... Uh, I was going to come to you anyway, <laughs> you know, but... U.S. measures uh, like uh, expo control and uh, uh, other, you know, things uh, which is uh, involved in um, CHIPS Act and IRA, uh, I mean, Korean companies, in fact, uh, 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 very much concerned about uh, export control of not only semiconductor, but semiconductor equipment. 
because uh, now you know that these companies are negotiating or discussing with the U.S. government, but the uh, U.S. government doesn't allow these firms to import uh, semiconductor equipment from Netherlands, and they are giving me they are giving our Korean companies one year extension and another year extension, which is very very difficult to uh, plan. They're replacing the uh, old equipment, and also regarding IRA, uh, there are many components, but. Uh, uh, this uh, law uh, mentioned about the country, uh, entity of concern, foreign entity of concern, uh, which is uh, very, you know, we can, we can predict uh, which country you are, you are mentioning, but uh, our companies recently want to know precisely what uh, country are you, are you referring to, or even what companies in China you are referring to. Without that, uh, we cannot uh, plan our business activities very precisely. So this is kind of concern we want to show you. Uh, we uh, agree and uh, actually support the U.S. policies uh, on uh, national security issues. We perfectly understand that. But uh, in, when you implement this kind of act and the trade policies, we are concerned about, you know, unnecessarily you are raising some issues uh, to uh, ally countries. Let me just add one more thing about Korea-China trade. And just, just to, before you go into that, it's, your point here is uh, transparency, predictability is uh, really important for business operations. Yes, okay, yes, yes. sorry, please. You know, when you look at the Korea and uh, China trade, uh, as uh, Mr. Kim mentioned, uh, sometimes, you know, our export, quota of our export to go to uh, China. Now we are saying that we have to reduce our dependency. But think about this one, uh, this uh, previous you know, session, uh, uh, Mr. Choi also mentioned that our trade structure between Korea and China has changed. The reason is this, uh, when we export very much to uh, China, we are not actually exporting goods or services to Chinese people. Uh, we are not exploiting Chinese market. We are exporting capital goods, <coughs> components Import. and materials to Korean subsidiaries operating in China. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when uh, 1992, when he opened the you know, diplomatic relations, more than 25,000 Korean companies went to China, mainly because they have a cheap labor. So we are supplying, we are actually exporting, but supplying parts and components to our own subsidiaries operating in China. And then uh, our companies in China manufacture things and export to the rest of the world. So in fact, we have a huge trade surplus against China, but we are not earning money from China. Mm -hmm. We are earning money from the rest of the world. So I'm, I'm not talking about 100% like that, but you know, most of the, our trade between Korea and China used to be that kind of inter-Korean company trade. Now, Korean companies are leaving China, not because of China, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, political, you know, uh, uh, disputes, uh, geopolitical dispute, but because uh, Chinese wages Labor. went up to more than ten thousand dollars, while uh, the wages in Vietnam is twenty-eight thousand, <coughs> twenty-eight hundred dollars. So Korean companies are leaving. In other words, less comp Korean companies operating in China. That means we are exporting less to our own companies in in in, in China. So. This is kind of trend. It's already this trend uh, started. We export much to Vietnam. Why? Samsung and Korean companies made huge you know, exports. The change of Korea-U.S. trade is coming from the fact that Korean companies are investing in, in the United States. Then we can you know, increase our, our trade. So um, in Korea-China trade is not because of you know, geopolitical competition between China and United States, but already Korean companies for the for the economic uh, reason they are leaving uh, China for that reason. All right, thanks, Mr. Minister. Um, really, you paint a, a complex picture that I think war is dovetails with what Mr. Kim was saying in terms of what is necessary in terms of a a comprehensive discussion between our two governments and managing this. Right, it, it dovetails with what he's saying. Tammy, I can tell your body language, you're about ready to jump out of your chair, then I'm gonna to come to the congressman after you, but Tammy, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ambassador. Um, uh, I just wanted to build on something Dr. Kennedy said about how quickly the IRA came together and uh, another unintended consequence that came out of it. Uh, one of the uh, stipulations was that uh, critical mineral domestic content, that where Korean battery companies uh, get lithium, uh, um, 
and uh, perhaps nickel. And I, I met with a major Korean battery CEO last December, and he said, Tammy, we invested in a lithium plant in Argentina and a nickel plant in Indonesia, but your IRA stipulates that those critical minerals must come from countries where the U.S. has an FTA. Of course, the U.S. Korea has an FTA, but Argentina and Indonesia don't. So my board is telling <coughs> me we need to divest, sell these assets. What country who's around, you know, trying to uh, grab every critical mineral they can and has a lot of money, who do you think is going to buy that? And is that what your Congress and administration want? And I'm like, you're, yeah, I get your point. Um, you know, we'll relay the messages. And, and, you know, the administration has made some small accommodations. Um, uh, the other point I wanted to mention is to hear um, my Korean friends say how we need, you know, the U.S. government needs to be more predictable and allow business certainty. The irony for me, who used to live in Korea 35 years ago, <laughs> when we used to tell the Korean government every day, you need to be more predictable. And yet now, to see my own government here, uh, it's true. They need to be more predictable. They need to have more collaboration and communication uh, with our, our friends and allies when these big pieces of legislation are coming out. And my last uh, interjection is just about the opaque Chinese policy. Uh, from an American business community, we know the, the Chinese phrase, kill the chicken to scare the monkey very well. We know exactly what they're doing when they do one of these big um, uh, examples. I'll stop there. No, it's Tammy, thanks for that. And so let me just come back to you with one follow-up. Uh, in terms of where, so first I will just say, um, more recently my own talking points as ambassador did include uh, demarches to the Korean government on transparency and predictability, ironically. So it, yeah. it runs both ways, right? And it's something that it's a constant work in progress, right? And Absolutely. I think it's really important, and I think it touches on the broader theme of this panel is that we're going into new territory, right, in a, in a very rapid way. And so trying to get the right and left limits, the rules of the road, the transparency, the predictability worked out are really important elements. Tammy, what should we do in terms of where would you focus? You know, you're a practitioner in this area. What would you like to see in the coming months and weeks to help facilitate this really important transparency and predictability on these critical uh, issues and sensitive technologies? Uh, great question. I think we're beginning to see some of it, and that's involved the business community from both sides. Give them a seat at the table. Um, I mean, you're talking about their business plans, um, so <coughs> involve them early and often. And we're the good news, I think we're beginning to see that. Um, you know, some of this large legislation done very quickly came out last minute, um, and, you know, we were all scrambling. And we're still um, trying to understand all the guidelines. Uh, but involve companies earlier uh, in the process would be my number one piece. All right. Let me throw it to the congressman here. You've been taking all of this in. And uh, first, any, any direction you want to go, I would, you know, obviously welcome because I've seen the copious notes you're taking. And so I'll just turn the floor over to you here. Well, I'm intrigued by the fact that uh, I don't think the government really thought much about supply chains <laughs> until just a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. So this is all new to us, and, and clearly COVID was a wake-up call, and we're still feeling our way around and doing it. But I, I do know that it needs to have collaboration, but those collaborations are sort of ad hoc. We sort of moved away from multilateral into ad hocs, whether it be the CHIPS Alliance, whether it be the Mineral Security Partnership that uh, South Korea is part of it, to address these thorny supply chain issues in a way where we're talking ahead of time. Because I know when you talk about predictable, you just don't want to be surprised to wake up in the morning and read in the paper that we did X. Hopefully, if we're communicating through these, uh, these forums, we can be having that conversations and talking about it ahead of time. And therefore, even though we likely will act without you know, taking a vote and having it be a majority but we'll have heard and we'll have talked ahead of time. So I think that's going to be critical in terms of us keeping a coordinated action, whether it's you know, publicly denounced or not, and us uh, less likely surprising each other. Mr. Park, do you, do you want to come in on this? Uh, can I have a please, please, kind of words to the kind of message to uh, deliver to the US? Please. Yeah, please, absolutely. <laughs> You know, I can go you're on and on. You're but, recreating uh, your, your role as trade minister here. We're bracing for impact. Yeah. I'm joking. No, it's <laughs> good. Briefly mention three Please, please, things. please. Uh, yeah, this is great. 
you know, even though we discuss bilaterally, you know, regionally, we are lacking, uh, I mean, Tammy maybe agree with me, we are lacking anything about restoring the function of the WTO. Yeah. Yep. I mean, we need a strong leadership uh, from the United States, uh, especially uh, we want to restore the function of uh, appellate body of the dispute settlement system. We have to strengthen the discipline on subsidies, you know. We have to make a rule for digital trade. So what I'm saying is here, yeah. together with Korea, we should uh, do something. I mean, uh, you have many businesses, but uh, along with that, at least we have to do something about uh, uh, that kind of thing. And the second is decoupling. Many people are confused. Decoupling of what, you know? Sometimes uh, people understand that U.S. and China want to stop trading each other. That's impossible, right? Uh, for the many years through globalization and trade, they are interconnected. Last year, U.S.-China trade is highest, highest, even though we have this kind of dispute. So uh, we, ha we have to limit the, our decoupling issues mm. to nationally, national security sensitive sectors only. Even within uh, semiconductor, uh, we, we, we are not talking about legacy chips. We are talking about very advanced level of uh, chips. That's what uh, I want to say. The last one is uh, if U.S. want to use some objective or uh, some standards or criteria in the IRA, for example, you may use uh, the very objective standard like environment, human rights, and intellectual pro property protection. Then you know, it's the right thing to do, then we can support fully without discriminating any specific countries because we are, we are talking about very objective terms. That's what uh, I would like to suggest. Okay, Congressman, please. Uh, I fully agree. We need to uh, get the WTO uh, functioning again. Now, we may still be relying more on either bilateral or plurilateral agreements to advance our trade agenda, but the, the core functioning of the WTO is uh, something that's long overdue. And I would say, you are right, we can't totally decouple, nor should we. Uh, it's a question of where are we over-reliant, and where do we need to diversify the supply chains, and where is it something that's critical to our national security? Uh, so it's, it's trying to find those precise ways uh, to, to address it. And, and I agree with you that we could have perhaps accomplished some of the same objectives that we were uh, seeking to achieve in the IRA by having re geographic restrictions by instead going with the objectives as you, as you mentioned. So thank you for those comments. All right, Tammy. Please. If I could make one point, um, it would also, I think the U.S. and South Korea need to work together to help us both, uh, for the U.S. in our case, rejoin CPTPP, the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, and to help Korea join. Um, you know, it is a comprehensive, high standard, rules-based system uh, that the U.S. and South Korea are on the outside of. Um, yes, you know, the Biden administration does have us talking in Asia again, doing something called the um, IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Uh, but the concerns about IPEF, it doesn't offer market I access. Um, the enforceability, it doesn't have strong dispute resolution. And how sustainable is it if it is done by executive order and it doesn't go through Congress? We have a bipartisan group of members uh, who are um, very unhappy with the IPEF because um, our Constitution says Congress controls trade. So uh, I'll leave you with that. All right. So we've got about 15 minutes left. I do want to get to questions, but you, you guys led us to uh, this, what you guys, these, this distinguished panel led us to <laughs> this uh, uh, great, um, or the, the, the last topic that I wanted to get to, the, the really important issue of trade and how this marries up with trade. Uh, Tammy, you've outlined some steps that we should take. Uh, how, and let me just begin by saying, um, I was on a panel with uh, John Newfer of the mm -hmm. SIA, Semiconductor, what is it? Semiconductor Industry, Industry Association. Association, and he basically said, "Look, it's it is great. We are bringing all of this semiconductor technology back into the U.S., but 70, 80 percent of our markets are overseas, mm -hmm. and we've got to figure out a way to marry up a, a robust trade agenda with our ability to bring reconstitute domestic industries here at home." So, can folks talk about that issue? Not just semiconductors, but as we're thinking about reconstituting these industries, how do we think about marrying this up to the trade agenda, number one? And number two, where does Korea play in all of that? 
I'll just start with 95% of the world lives outside the borders of the United States. So if American companies want to grow, they have to export. Um, and since we do not have today a functioning World Trade Organization, the WTO is paralyzed, and I would argue that the U.S. is, is part of the reason for that paralysis. Um, what happens in the meantime is um, company, countries do bilateral agreements or regional agreements. So we have CPTPP. We also have an, the largest trade agreement in the world, uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Korea is part of, RCEP, a Chinese-led agreement, not as high standard as CPTPP, but it has rules. These organizations, the, um, from a business perspective, these trade ministers meet on a regular basis, and they're able to talk about new and emerging issues like digital um, things are, or like supply chains as things are coming up and the U.S. is on the outside. In the trade world, we have a saying, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably on the menu. So if we want to help America continue to grow, we need to re, uh, rejoin the game and with no better partner than South Korea, whom we have already a strong agreement. Um, so I'd love to see the U.S. and South Korea start talking about let's uh, how, do, how do we rejoin, or how do, in Korea's case, join uh, CPTPP? Uh, the UK, first country, they've joined. Uh, a bunch of other countries, China and Taiwan, uh, and a, whole, a long list of countries. South Korea has raised their hand. Uh, I'll stop. Sorry, I see your hand. Congressman, Go. come on in. Come on in. Go, please. Uh, let me just say that we are being very reckless, because if you think about having an export control, so we're not going to sell something uh, to China or select other people, you are by definition dividing the market, which means that they're going to come up with an alternative they have to. And their alternative from the beginning may not be as good, <coughs> but if you take their industrial mate, if you take their strong connections with the global south, they're going to start getting a slice of the market that's going to grow. Yeah. And if they get to the point where they take so much of the market that our leading technology companies no longer can uh, have the scale to keep the research and development to keep ahead, we lose our lead. So to, to have export controls unmatched with a vigorous effort to expand markets is, is very reckless. I think also when you think about who, who are we benefiting in our trade policy today, no one benefits more than China because we have pulled back from opening up markets because we had a, a difficult uh, relationship on our trade with uh, the abuses that China had. But what about all the other countries? And we've left the whole rest of the world open to have a stronger trading relationship with uh, the PRC. You think about the combination of pulling back from TPP, CPTPP, uh, what happened was at the same time we put in export controls with, with uh, the PRC. So that encouraged PRC sourcing to come through those other countries, as you already just talked about. Uh, having China develop stronger relationships with Southeast Asia because of our, our tariffs that we've imposed on them, at the same time we pulled back from uh, Southeast Asia. So uh, geopolitically, uh, we just cannot continue with the path we're on of export controls unmatched with an aggressive approach to expand markets uh, for Americans. I'm not against uh, targeted export controls. I'm against not matching it with trade. Comprehensive. All right, uh, Minister Parker, then I'm going to come to Mr. Kim, and we're going to get to questions. Well, uh, I feel very strange because we are living in a very strange uh, world because the uh, U.S. is doing build back better. They want to re-strengthen the manufacturing sector. It sounds very, very strange, but uh, using... Uh, like uh, friend shoring, reshoring, or ally shoring. So you want to invite all the investment into the United States. Then what can we do? I mean, uh, we can sell something to Korean companies in, in the U.S. <coughs> well, uh, given the fact that the U.S. is really considering about national security or economic security reasons, uh, we have to accept uh, this kind of fact. Then uh, in return of this kind of uh, build back better policies, Korea need very advanced R&D partner in Korea. So we don't have to produce you know, manufacturing goods, but we are doing lots of research on semiconductors and AI, all kinds of things, you know, through uh, you know, human exchanges, whatever. 
unless you do that, uh, we are all, our company is all going to the United States and our laborers and people are saying, what, what can we do? We are losing our jobs. You know, same thing uh, Mr. Trump mm -hmm. uh, emphasized that, you know. So I want to emphasize here that, you know, bilaterally, we have to do more mutually beneficial interactions. We invest, then you should uh, right. help us uh, advance our technology through R&D activities. This is one thing I want to emphasize. Yeah. yeah, it's a great point. We didn't cover that nearly enough in this panel, but thank you for raising it. Also, I, I, if I'm correct still, the U.S. is still the number one uh, FDI contributor to the Republic of Korea. It's been a long-standing strength of our relationship mm -hmm. and perhaps just exploring ways to double down and expand on that in sensitive areas is a really important. But these days, lots of European companies are investing in Korea yes. because they uh, recognize our so-called manu manufacture capability Perhaps. of yeah. certain goods. But just one thing, yeah. uh, Tammy, if you talk about CPTPP, tell uh, our uh, 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 committee chairman, chairwoman, uh, congresswoman uh, Lee, because she, she, you know. She's in the power. Her su subcommittee is dealing with uh, CPTPP, uh, so uh, you should talk to her. Uh, Please excellent. help us, help uh, us. Uh, <laughs> excellent. Lead the way. It sounds like a sidebar discussion at the end. All right, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Kim, the final word is to you before we get to a couple of questions here. Yes, um, continuing on the dis uh, discussion on industrial policy, post-globalization, reconstitution of global trading regime. Well, um, if this were uh, the off-the-record event, I would have, have uh, a message to the U.S. government. But uh, generally speaking, um, <coughs> from the point of, of the uh, free trade advocates like Tammy, it is very difficult not to cri criticize these industrial policy, subsidy policy of the, of the, of the, of the global governments here. Um, this is the reminiscence of famous uh, Korean scholar <coughs> at the University of Cambridge. His name is Professor uh, Hajun Chang. His main thrust, which is, is, which is this, um, no matter how high a development state your country is in, you can never, you should never give up the manufacturing because manufacturing is the backbone of the economy of any country. So that's what he said. But uh, 10 years ago, at the peak of, of globalization, we, the majority of, of, of free trade advocates, downplayed this kind of philosophy as manufacturing fetish. But today, most of the governments in, in the world follow, follow this uh, Professor Chang's you know, theory. Um, so the, the world changed. In the past, we lived in a world of excess supply sust sustained by the most efficient way of production. Um, so boosting the demand, opening the market in the foreign countries, and lowering trade barrier was important. Today, we are living in the shortage of supply. We are still producing uh, goods and services in an efficient manner, but the focus has moved to securing resilience in supply in the long term, and resolving a short-term supply crunch. For that, and because you cannot produce everything in, in one, one place, ultimately there should be a uh, strong, resilient international supply chain to be built up. Um, at least for now, and in, in the near term, the main trend, not just in the U.S., but also in everywhere else, is to build a strong, strong manufacturing basis domestically. Um, I, I'll get to that. But what, what is the solution? There are two wrong answers. First one, we are not going to back to the globalization earlier. There is still ongoing reflection how uh, this work, this will work to middle class workers, families, domestically and e equitably to the global community. Another wrong answer, wrong answer is, is uh, the old type of industrial policy. That's, uh, to me, it seems to be regression. So right kind of answer in, in the middle is the strategic division of labor among trusted partners because too heavy investment without concentration among, among these indus heavy industrial uh, countries, there will be a global excess of supply sometime soon. The one great example, you, you, you mentioned the reconstitution and, and, and then kind of institutional mechanism. We have great bilateral mechanism, foreign ministries, industry ministries, science ministries, even the National Security you know, uh, Council 
they have these bilateral uh, channels. We have tri um, excellent trilateral relationship with, together with Japan. We have an uh, Indo-Pacific economic framework. Although WTO is not in good shape, we still have a functioning APEC and G G20. But there is one great example of this, uh, what the media calls is chip, chip for alliance, is semiconductor alliance. But uh, there is a misunderstanding on, on, on and or wrong anticipation of this alliance. Because uh, somebody described this uh, semiconductor alliance as an alliance to fight with China. In, in, in the economic security issue, we can, we can divide issues into two, two different categories. One is promotion, the other is protection. The promotion is, is, is kind of make your, uh, yourself or your allies strong, that's promotion. Protection is a kind of make your enemies weak. But this cheap alliance is, uh, is contrary to, to what, what, what people believe, is the kind of promotion alliance. It's a, it's a great mechanism to coordinate our uh, uh, industrial policy or, or incentive policy to avoid duplication of, of investment. That's the uh, uh, ultimate objective. Uh, for the sake of uh, efficiency, we four countries uh, uh, gather together to, to, to make progress on, on workforce development because workforce shortage is a, is a big issue in, in, in not, not just in the United States but in Korea. And we, 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 we share the information about job training, the exchange of people, how to uh, expedite and, you know, movement of, of technicians and engineers across the border to help each other. That's kind of an alliance and institutional mechanism that our, our friendly countries, allies and partners can work together on. All right, thanks for that. Uh, we'll open it up to questions. I would just end by saying there's a really interesting theme here that's developed in terms of how much market forces are are really, let's put it this way, how much, there will be some government uh, government intervention. There'll probably be more of it because we are in a different world, as we say, and trying to manage these supply chains and all that. At the same time, the market mechanisms are ruthlessly efficient in allocating some of these elements and how governments get this balance right, how they coordinate among uh, each other is going to be a huge challenge going forward, right? So we don't, so we get to the, the right outcomes or at least the uh, less, less, uh, less bad outcomes uh, as uh, they say sometimes. So let's get to questions here. We've got just a few minutes left. Uh, take one or two questions. Maybe I'll take uh, three questions at once and we'll try to do a speed round here and gavel down on time so everyone can get to lunch. Any questions? Over. And please uh, state your name and for the interest of time, try to keep the question brief and with a question mark. Uh, yes, very brief. <laughs> Ray Michael Bridgewater, our concentration is around health and technology. Uh, healthcare, where is healthcare uh, from uh, uh, your country perspective? What are some of the uh, top areas uh, we just got through uh, COVID. Uh, so one of the top uh, areas and top uh, c uh, concerns and challenges. All right, excellent. Any other questions? I can take maybe one more. All right, one back there. Uh, I think someone mentioned uh, the research and development in high technology has been down in terms of budget from 40 some percent to maybe 3 percent, whatever. So it's within USA, but how is in, um, in South Korea in terms of research budget? Okay, great. Okay, those are the two questions we have time for. Why don't, Mr. Kim, you, you uh, probably are best equipped to answer the R&D budget question. Do you have uh, a sense of where uh, South Korea is in terms of its uh, spending on research and development and the trend lines, any general comments on research and development activities in South Korea? Well, I, I will speak about healthcare first. Um, okay, they take because, them both. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, uh, we didn't cover this Im important uh, sector of industry. Uh, <coughs> one thing I would like to let you know is Korea and the United States uh, uh, established uh, what they call Next Generation Critical Emerging Technology Dialogue be between two national security advisors. So at, at this dialogue, we will cover such issues, semiconductor batteries, 
AI and quantum, one of the most important uh, you know, sectors is, is bio industry. You know, the Biden administration announced uh, their, their, their plan to boost uh, bio industry within the U.S. In, in, at the form of executive order last year. Korea has also the same ambition to boost our uh, uh, bio industry. And recently, uh, Pfizer and, and Samsung Biologics announced a deal of cooperation amount, uh, the amount is, is a half billion dollars. So uh, Samsung Biologics will, will produce a Pfizer pharmace pharmaceutical products. So there is a great relationship between our two countries on, on, on bio. And then we also have an expectation to expand our cooperation together with India because they have a strong uh, you know, basis on the pharmaceutical production. Uh, I don't have an uh, exact figure of, of, of R&D spending, but generally we have, uh, in the 80s and 90s, we have uh, Korean government ma maintained a subsidy to, for, the, uh, for the purpose of industrial development. Mm -hmm. But uh, when it, uh, through 2000 and, and, and after coral safety, we have significantly reduced these industrial policy subsidies. You know, we didn't resurrect our in industrial policy subsidies. But our, uh, uh, the vast majority, vast amount of, of uh, government spending is, is basically R&D. So I would say most of our, our support for the industry is only for R&D and nothing else. Thank you. Just briefly, I mentioned uh, about the health care. I think both government, both uh, leaders agreed uh, through this uh, summit meeting. They want to uh, together, jointly together, develop uh, medical products using AI, which is one of the you know, Im important area. Regarding R&D percentages, uh, maybe uh, we are very top country among OECD, but I met some scientists a uh, few months ago. Don't mention about percentage of GDP. For the very advanced technology, we need to figure out absolute amount of R&D spent, mm. not the you know, percentage of GDP. So maybe uh, percentage of GDP is important, but more important thing is how much actually you are spending for R&D is more important. All right, we are going to leave it there. We are at time. We could go on all afternoon. This has been a fantastic panel. Please give it up for our panelists. Big round of applause. Thanks. Thank you. And again, thanks to the Wilson Center. Thanks to the East Asia Foundation for really uh, a fabulous event here today. Okay, thank you. So Thank you so much. Um, I just want to make quick, um, well, I want to give thanks to myself, um, also to our core <coughs> event sponsor, East Asia Foundation. Um, special thanks to Chairman Kim sung an and the staff, um, Kang chang and Shin yun hee we, we work with together. This would not have been possible, obviously. Also, Chairman Kim tae thank you so much for coming, Chairperson Lee Jae-jung, and Representative Choi young -do. Um, also, to, thanks to U.S. Congressman Mark uh, Takano and Ami Vera who were able to join us today. And of course, the fabulous moderators, David Sanger, and I always say Ambassador Mark Lippert is just the rock star of a moderator. Um, <laughs> I know this because we have this bi-weekly show, um, Capital Cable, where he gets to moderate. He, sh he should really have a separate job. Um, he should have his own show. But anyway, thanks to all our panelists as well, um, Tammy Overby, um, Congressman Mark Kennedy, Minister Park Teo, and um, Mr. Kim Young Jae. Of course, this would not have been possible without Wilson Center um, event and AV teams. So thank you, our brilliant interpreters who are behind the scenes, but they were great. Uh, Eun Young Lee and John Lee. Um, so special shout out to them. And of course, the Korea Center staff, the program associate, Kayla Orta, really instrumental in putting this together and our, also our interns, um, Chan Mogu and Alex Kim, thank you so much. Uh, when you're leaving here, please return your headsets and then people who are here and can join us for lunch, please um, join us for lunch. Lunch will be served um, in the cafeteria. And this concludes U.S. Rock at 70 Outlook after Washington <laughs> Declaration Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.